Does Newport JV girls soccer is underway in their first game, winning for nothing in the first half. Um, and I turned it off. Um, and uh, all right, so welcome everyone. Six o'clock call to order um, for our March 11th, 2021 uh, school board meeting. I am not seeing our student reps. Do they need to be let in? Let me check right now. Here comes Morgan. And there's Paul. Excellent. Hi, guys. All right. Um, so I know we have a busy agenda tonight and um, some recognitions to start off with. So I'm looking for a motion to establish the agenda. So moved. Seconded. Any discussion? Uh, the motion is to approve the agenda as published. Um, if you agree, please indicate by saying aye. And any opposed, say nay. Um, agenda is approved by a vote of five to zero. Next, we have our recognition um, of Education Support Professionals Week. So we also have recognition tonight for our um, all state and our all, all Northwest Music Award students. So we, um, yes, this week is um, Classified Employees Week. Governor Inslee passes a, a proclamation every year on um, this specific week for recognizing our support personnel in our schools and how vital they are and um, how even more so, how even more so in during this pandemic. And so um, he has signed his regular pro proclamation acknowledging the um, our classified school employees being involved in every aspect of education, maintaining our buildings, um, supporting our students in instruction. And I apologize because the proclamation didn't get attached to the agenda, the agenda, but um, it, it's, we have sent messaging to all of our employees on thanking them and our gratefulness for all of their work in support of our students. Next, I would like to um, introduce our all state and all Northwest music honor group members. So tonight we're going to recognize both from Mercer Island High School and from Islander Middle School, the 2021 um, honor group. There are 37 in total. Our MIHS and IMS band, choir and orchestra students were selected from a pool of auditions submitted from across five states as members of the all Northwest and all state honor groups. While there will be no in-person honor assemblies this year, the Washington Music Educators Association will be mailing a decal and a certificate of congratulations to all accepted students. In addition, WMEA will be offering online clinics to all students who submitted auditions this year where they're not accepted on Saturday, April 24th. Sounds like a fun event. So we are going to have, we, I see we have some of our teachers joining us and I'm so excited to see um, our, our band program leader, Parker Bixby and Haley Smith at the middle school and uh, Vicki White Maltoon, our orchestra leader. And where is our choir teacher? Is Annalise in attendance? 
And what I'm going to do is introduce each of them. And I believe they have some students and I hope they know which students are here because we do have a lot in attendance tonight who um, will ask them to introduce and we'll um, have those students come in and join us so we can at least see their, their smiling faces. Oh, there's Annalise, welcome Annalise. We're glad to have you here. Um, we don't get to, this is usually our biggest group. We have, we meet in our, in our small room and we fill the room with parents and students from this group. So we still wanna see their, their wonderful smiling faces. So what I'm gonna ask is for, um, I'll introduce the teacher and then have them introduce their students. And um, Dr. Rundle, you are gonna have to do a yeoman's job without our director of technology there to help you tonight to bring those students in just so we can, can see them and congratulate them. So let's start with orchestra and Vicki White Multoon. Vicki, we're so glad you're here with us tonight. Would you like to introduce your students? Oops. You should be able to unmute. I usually have a problem getting the, the, the microphone on. Uh, yes, we are so happy to have with us tonight, I believe we have uh, Marty uh, Flickinger and uh, Nandini Mishra. Uh, Ethan Cheney and Sophia Rosales. And if, they, if students, if you could turn your cameras on so we can see you, we are so excited and, and happy for you and glad that you are here with us. Vicki, would you like to share anything about their accomplishment? Well, I, I think the most important thing here is that uh, this is not something they had to do. In fact, they could have just said, oh, you know, that's too much work. But we had a large number who challenged themselves and nine who made it and four who are here this evening. And uh, I couldn't be prouder of the fact that they that they put themselves through this and it was quite a process. So I'm very, very proud of these guys that uh, that made it. Made well it. Congratulations, students. We are so thrilled to have you here with us. Perhaps what we could do is have each of you um, turn on your microphone. We know your teacher, your um, director, your teacher has introduced you, but we'd love to hear um, the instrument that you play as you have earned this honor. So um, let's start with Marty. Yeah, um, I play the cello. Um, yeah, and I'm in the All State Orchestra this year. Congratulations. Thank you. Yes. Nandini. Uh, hi, um, I played the violin in our MIHS orchestra and the viola in our, in the Allstate Orchestra. Congratulations. Sophia. Hi, I'm Sophia and I play violin in both MIHS and Allstate Orchestra. And Ethan. Hi, I'm a cellist. I'm in the Allstate Orchestra and I play with Marty in Jean Bray. Well, congratulations, orchestra students. As I said, we are so delighted to have you here with us and congratulations on all your hard work. Let's move on to our Islander Middle School band and our director, one of our directors there, Haley Smith. Haley. Yeah, um, we're so thrilled to have um, so many people make it this year. And I'd just like to invite uh, the following people to, um, to introduce themselves. Eva Jantos, David Bai. Uh, hi, I'm in the, uh, I play clarinet. I'm in the IMS eighth grade band and I play for Allstate Baker Band. Or no, Rainier Band actually. Back to Eva. Uh, hi, I'm Ava. I play trombone, and I need to double check which band I'm playing for for the Allstate band. Walter. Moving on to Oliver. Some of them I'm still promoting, or I haven't found them yet. Got it. If you're in the audience and you are one of the students, um, just make sure that you uh, that you have yourself named uh, by what your teacher would be calling you by, please. Thank you. 
while they're while they're doing that i just want to say that these just like and just like what vicky said these folks took it upon themselves to practice to apply on this completely new platform um online and um just it was just so exciting to see and work with them and to see uh their their progress and the fact that they're here tonight um just it's a, it's encouraging as a teacher but also um for this community so um, we just were really excited about you guys so one more time let's see oliver lee i do not see okay what about derek i see derek right there Hi, my name is Derek C. I play trombone and I'm in the seventh grade band. Ryan Kinder. Uh, I play percussion at the eighth grade band. Rowan Porteous. I'm not sure I see you yet. All right. Um, this is uh, some of the some of the students that were able to make it. We really want to congratulate all who auditioned and all who made it. Congratulations, students. We are so excited to have you here with us. All right, Mr. Bixby, you are up with the MIHS band students. My pleasure. Let me just first say unbelievably proud of these middle school musicians and and the initiative and the work uh, that they chose right they chose to put in to to reach that accomplishment incredible and so proud that that someday i get you to be a part of uh about of our high school program and i know that that ms milton feels the same way and ms rocco feels the same way about about uh, the middle school choir and the middle school orchestra. Second thing I wanna say is that, you know, really grateful to all of the huge organizations that over this crazy 13 months have extended themselves to create these opportunities. WMEA and, uh, and National Association for Music Education and our site administrators who've helped and our booster organizations who've helped with application fees and all, all, at Mercer Island Schools Foundation and uh, all you know takes a village folks and uh certainly certainly during this time uh it has as well so incredibly proud and super super excited to have you up here at the high school eighth graders really excited to see you and congratulations on this honor it's a big deal so what was so way to go um i am equally proud of my high school kids who i miss so much my high school young men and women who i miss so much um and who are so uh, accomplished and have worked so hard to make this year's experience um, one of growth and and uh, one where they've been able to really push themselves and, and achieve. So really proud of you. So I might introduce all of them and, and really, really quickly, and then I'll call out the ones that I see on the screen who might be able to tell you what they play and maybe what grade they're in and whether they're all state or all Northwest. So uh, the high school band musicians that that uh, were selected to all state all Northwest are Toby Glick and Yui Halverson and Ryan Wong and Eric Larson and Angie Choi and Sabrina Chun and Ben Kinder. I can't wait to see these people and Divya Krishnaswamy and Thomas Mangold and Kellen Wedgwood and Maya Wong. Hi, Maya. And Alana Yang. And just so, so proud of all of these folks. So let's see really quickly, folks, introduce yourself. Eric, let's start with you. Um, my name is Eric. I play the flute and I'm in the All Northwest Orchestra. What grade are you in, Eric? What grade are you in, Eric? Uh, I'm a junior. All right. Yeah, you are. Good job. And how about Thomas? Hi, um, I'm a junior as well. Uh, and I play bass clarinet in the um, uh, All State Concert Band. Plays a mean bass clarinet. How about you, Kellen? Love the hair. Thank you. Um, I am a junior as well. I play trumpet and I am in the Allstate uh, concert band. And it's a family affair in the Kinder family. How about you, Ben? Uh, I'm Ben. I'm a junior and I play French horn and also in the concert band. Thanks, Ben. And Maya. Hello, 
Hello, I'm Maya. I play bassoon and I forgot which band it was, but I'm also a junior. You've all seen Maya before. Maya was the marching band member who was hoisted up above the crowd surfing in our field show for Pasadena. She was the one up above the whole rest of the crowd. She's a good sport. And let's see, Alana. Hi, I'm Alana. I'm a junior as well. And I play the clarinet um, in both the MIHS Wind Ensemble and the All-State Orchestra. I think that's everybody. So thanks to the board for taking the time and to Superintendent Koloski for taking the time to recognize these great kids, all of them, band, orchestra, and choir at all levels. They're just, they're fantastic models for the rest of the kids in our program. Really appreciate it. And we are not done. We have our choir here um, and their director, Annalise Rockhow. She is our choir director at both the middle school and the high school. And Annalise, I believe that you also have a student here who made um, a great accomplishment. So we'd love to have you introduce her. Yeah, so um, we had two students this year audition for the All Northwest Ensembles in all states, and they are not able to be here tonight, but I just want to quickly shout out to those two, um, Maggie Peterson and Nandini Rathod, both in the All Northwest Mixed Choir. Um, last spring, we had the opportunity for students to also audition for the All National Ensembles, also through the National Association for Music Education, and um, Annie Hochberg should be somewhere in the meeting, hopefully, fingers I crossed. Saw, I did see a Hochberg in there, and I will pull it up. Give me just a second. Yeah, and Annie, as, as you pull her in, I just, Annie um, took, a, took it upon herself to say, Mrs. Rocco, I'm recording this audition, and I'm going to be an all-national, and, and she got in to the mixed choir as a soprano, too, and she got to participate in some virtual rehearsals and um, a virtual ensemble with two different rep pieces of repertoire um, in January. And the premiere just happened last week. So um, those those recordings are also available on YouTube for that all national ensemble. So- um, And she's in that. now. Annie, go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Annie Hochberg. Um, I'm a senior at MIHS. Um, I participated in the NAFNI, uh, NAFNI Nationals for choir and I'm a soprano too. Yeah, super proud of Annie. She just took that initiative and same with our two students who got into All Northwest this year. Thank you so much for taking the time tonight for this recognition to Superintendent Koloski and the board. Um, I echo everything that Parker says with all the support that our music programs receive and um, we're just so thankful to be in a community that really supports us. Hey Fred, we, we missed Oliver Lee earlier. He was signed in under his mother's name, but he's signed back in uh, now under his own name from Thank the band you. program. Appreciate it. I'm going to promote right now. Coming in. Should be in now. Hi, Oliver, welcome. Hello. Want to go ahead and introduce yourself and uh, your accomplishment? Yeah, sure. So my name is Oliver and I play trombone for the seventh grade band. Well, congratulations to all of our musicians. We are so proud of all of you. Big round of applause. Um, to take such initiative to do this on your own is um, just amazing. We are um, pleased to have you here. We cannot wait till we get to hear you play in person when we all get to be together again. I see Mr. Bixby nodding his head. He's, I'm, I'm there too, Mr. Bixby. In fact, um, today is an anniversary, not such a great one. Today is the anniversary of the decision to um, close our schools. So that's, uh, we close the day after after this on March 12th. So we are excited to get to see y'all back in person here with some pretty unique kinds of mitigation strategies for all of our musicians. So um, again, congratulations and thank you so much for taking the time to join us here tonight. I think this is the first time we've had two screens, at least on my screen, it's two screens of folks that we're um, getting to look at and recognize at our meeting. So thank you students and thank you so much teachers for um, being here with them, we, we really do appreciate you all so much. And we're gonna- Thank you. 
we'll um, take a, a second or so to um, back everyone out so that President Lurie can see who she needs to be able to see to, to move forward in the meeting. I guess while we get backed out or people get backed out, I will um, do the spiel for the public input um, just so we're all on the same page. Um, this is public input. Uh, the meeting is a meeting of the board in public. It is not a public meeting that guarantees interaction between members of the public and members of the board. If you would like to address the board on a particular issue, please complete the form attached on the agenda and submit it to the board secretary by emailing the completed form at least 60 minutes prior to the meeting. When addressing the board at the meeting, please limit your remarks to not more than three minutes. Appoint a spokesperson if the concern is a group concern and if desired, provide written documentation to the board secretary. Public comments that name or otherwise identify a district student are not permitted without permission of that student's parent or legal guardian. The board may direct the superintendent to respond at a later date to the issues expressed. We have four individuals slated for public comment today. Give us a minute, President yeah. Larry. We are sure our director of technology tonight. He um, has a family emergency. So Fred and I are doing our best here to <laughs> Yeah, Absolutely. And I was just going to call people them. as I saw them pop up on the screen. So whatever order happens, I, I will pass the um, baton, so to speak. President Lurie, just so I know, and I have this, um, who are the four names? Just so I make sure I have them too. We have um, Dylan Prescott. Okay. Matt. Goltz, okay. Dana Levy, and McCall Avery. Great. The only one I don't see is Dana so far, but I'll keep my eyes out um, for her if she comes in. But I have the other three queued up in whatever okay. order you want to go. Um, do we, are we just, um, are we not using the handy screen that? Um, I have it. Yep. I'm ready to okay. go whenever you are. <laughs> okay. Oh. Um, all right, so first up, we have Dylan Prescott. Okay. Hello, my name is Dylan, and I'm a fifth grader at Northwood Elementary School. I want to thank everyone for their hard work to make my ability to return to school a reality. My teacher did an incredible job during our remote learning, and I feel it was a positive experience. But there is nothing like being in a classroom with my teacher and peers, and I know it took a lot of work from a lot of people to make it happen, and I just want to express my gratitude for getting us back in person. Thank you to the teachers, support staff, custodians, bus drivers, administrators, and school board for your timeless effort to put students first and provide us with amazing educational opportunities, even in the face of a pandemic. Dylan, thank you so much for telling us your feelings tonight. Um, next up, we have Matt Goltz. Let me make sure he's in. I don't see him. I think he's under Senor Mateo, if I recall correctly. Yes, he's in the attendees. It. He'll be in here. All right. My name is Matt, my name is Matt Goltz, or as my students know me, Senor Mateo, and I'm the Spanish teacher at Lake Ridge Elementary, and this year at West Mercer, West Mercer Elementary also. Dear administrators, board members, the Mercer Island community, and in particular, MISD families and amigos. Four years ago, I moved to the Seattle area, having recently secured the Spanish teacher position at Lake Ridge. 
While still in its infancy now, the program then had only been in place for one year. During that short time, it became clear how significant an impact it would have on our youngest learners. After all, the science is indisputable. Learning a second or third language boosts problem solving, critical thinking, and listening skills, in addition to improving memory, concentration, and the ability to multitask. Children proficient in other languages also show signs of enhanced creativity and mental flexibility. The Spanish language and cultures have been a part of my life since I moved to Spain at the age of four. I spent my entire childhood living in Madrid and I changed careers to become an educator in 2016 because I realized I wanted to share my experiences in and knowledge about the Spanish speaking world with the next generation of leaders and innovators. I am so grateful to have been a member of an extraordinary team of educators who devoted the last five years to the MISD elementary Spanish program to sure, ensure its, its success. A program that has been all inclusive, catering to and meeting the needs of all, and particularly our most vulnerable students, such as those on IEPs. Hours upon hours have been invested in writing our own curriculum, one that aligns with each grade level and to state and national standard, standards, a curriculum that this very board greenlighted less than two years ago. I cannot express in words how proud, how proud I am of your children. They have been so receptive and eager to learn the world beyond their borders. And though our contact time has been limited, particularly this year due to COVID, all my amigos have demonstrated a passion to learn Spanish. In their eyes, I see the same inquisitiveness I had at their age. And my hope is that they continue to have opportunities to learn the language that I hold so dear to my heart. I understand fiscal responsibility. However, I also question that if this program gets fully cut, what is the likelihood it will ever be reinstated? We have successfully kept it up, running with a skeleton crew similar to that of art, and I fear that losing this unique program for good will be very detrimental to our students. My primary goal has always been to make a positive difference in the lives of children, and I'm truly honored to have had the chance to teach yours. I only hope that they have learned as much from me as I have from them. Thank you for your unwavering support of MISD's elementary Spanish program. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much. Um, Next, we have uh, McCall Avery. Hi, my name is McCall Avery and it says Avery McCall. Does that matter? It does not. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, is that okay if I start? Please do. Oh, okay. On March 12th, 2020, Mercer Island closed schools for six weeks. Half these kids still learn at home 364 days later, and this anniversary is not cause for celebration. Franklin Delano Roosevelt declared, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. And this quotation also starts a USA Today op-ed penned by four pediatric professors declaring the CDC misinterpreted their research. These experts insist the best way to overcome fear is to follow the science. Science and experience show we can and should safely open schools for full-time learning and keep them open while reducing the six foot rule many administrators say prevent the full return. Thank you for creating a temporary fix and responding to the 80 plus percent of parents who want kids in a classroom. While six hours a week is an initial start, our kids want, need, and deserve better. The proven safety protocols, systems, and strategies in place give me hope that Mercer Island can be the bold and brave bellwether for the Puget Sound and resurrect the traditional full day week that we all took for granted. Last Friday, the Oregon governor mandated all schools open due to the teacher vaccine rollout. On Monday, the New Mexico governor followed. I shared this information on a Parents of Mercer Island Facebook page and got flagged for possibly violating the group's rules for posting political material. Since when did kids sitting in a classroom become political? These two female governors are Democrats, eager to see their states exit the bottom quartile of public schools failing in-person instruction. Governor Inslee says he wants schools to open, yet he insists these are local decisions. Many governors are stepping up, but Governor Inslee's silence on this issue in particular is deafening. As long as our kids are at the mercy of politicos beholden to teachers unions for campaign cash, our public school kids are toast. 
we need you to fill this leadership vacuum. We need you to have the intestinal fortitude to assert local control and reduce the six foot rule. And we need you to embrace innovation and assume risk in the name of common sense and the common good. With bars open before schools and leaders prioritizing casinos before kids, common sense isn't so common. Please save our children dangling in the political crossfire. Kids are a fraction of today's society, but they're 100% of our future. Ignore the vocal minority clamoring and choosing fear over moving forward. Fear is not a medical diagnosis. One year later, remote learning is the harm for which we don't know the long-term damage. We're counting on you to do right by our kids with courage, common sense, and kindness. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our final individual who submitted a request um, doesn't appear to be present. So I will declare public input closed at this time. Um, next up, we have our student representative report, Morgan and Paul. Hi, everyone. Hi. All right, so we're um, excited to have part of our student advisory um, in person. Um, for the last week. So that was really fun. And we got some good content in our report. Um, so we're going to be starting off with Lake Ridge. And um, at Lake Ridge, students are very happy to get back to school in the hybrid model and are getting used to the new protocols. When students come to class, they must wash their hands thoroughly before getting seated. And during this time, some teachers have created logic puzzles and fun activity packets for students to work on while they wait for everybody to wash their hands. And this has been a really great way to maximize class time and also make sure that both in-person and streaming students can have something kind of fun to do. And then some of our Lake Ridge representatives also shared that teachers um, have been making sure to call on in-person and streaming students evenly so that nobody feels as if they're being overlooked. Uh, and while we weren't able to get any specific talking points from West Mercer students, they seem to agree with the consensus of other elementary schools that we received at the superintendent advisory meeting. Uh, at Island Park, however, teachers were noticing that the one hour lunch period was not enough time for some students to drive home and eat lunch. So they decided to allot an extra 20 minutes for them to make the trip. And during this 20 minute period, any students who are streaming in that day uh, got to join the class Zoom and have some extra social time. Uh, this opportunity was especially meaningful for fully virtual students who don't typically have as many chances to mingle with their classmates. Island Park students also pointed out that they were experiencing significantly less distractions in the classroom than they had been while Zooming from their bedrooms. So over at Northwood, students also found it much easier to focus in the classroom and felt that their quality of learning was already improving. And though initially some students were a little bit concerned about difficulty wearing a mask all day long at school, um, students reported feeling surprised with how quickly they actually forgot that they were wearing a mask at all. And then some kids um, are, however, wishing that there could be a little bit more interaction between in-person and streaming students. At Islander Middle School, teachers gave reportedly helpful presentations of how hybrid will be structured for the students. And middle schoolers were also excited to choose their classes for next year, especially eighth graders who are looking forward to joining the high school. And so at the high school on Tuesday, um, high school students received their A, B hybrid group assignments. And I know I was getting tons of messages from friends trying to figure out who was in what group and um, <laughs> just trying to figure out um, all of that. And then a group of seniors also organized a virtual event where speakers talked to sophomores about the Holocaust during Islander Hour. And this event really gave students a chance to interact with Holocaust survivors um, and really gave them an opportunity to hear personal stories, which is very powerful. And then MIHS ASB also recently facilitated a collaboration with the local Sano Cafe for a new drink called the Islander Smoothie. Um, and this maroon colored smoothie can be ordered until April 5th and all MIHS students can get a discount with their ASB card. And so just definitely props to leadership for coming up with some really creative ways to be keeping the spirit alive. Uh, we also wanted to announce to the board that next week is week on the hill in replace of our typical day in the hill where we will be meeting uh, virtually with our state legislators to advocate for student needs. And just briefly, some of the topics that we plan to cover in these meetings include student wellness and how the isolation from COVID-19 has affected students and steps that we can take to combat the harm, uh, education recovery and how the lost knowledge and lack of proficiency in certain areas due to the lack of in-person learning may require future adjustments to the academic requirements and curriculum in schools in the coming years. Uh, enrollment budgeting, budgeting and how the decline in enrollment uh, lowers the budgets of vital programs. 
and also some specific needs of the Mercer Island School District, such as academic and college counseling concerns and a lack of equity that we experienced in the technology front during the pandemic. And then we also hope to attend some student advocate, advocacy meetings with Governor Inslee, Lieutenant Governor Heck, and the Superintendent of Public Instruction, Chris Breakdahl. Thank you. Thank you. May I jump in with a little bit to tag on to their meeting? Um, we were we attempted to do a hybrid meeting for our superintendent student advisory and um, invited some of our high schoolers. And so of course, Paul and Morgan both came to our hybrid meeting. We were in the boardroom. So we had Zoomies and Roomies. We had um, Dr. Rundle, myself and Paul and Morgan and one other student in the room. And um, we all had our masks on, but it was, it was pretty joyful to be able to be in the room. Um, I will, I will share that Morgan looked at me at the end of the meeting and said, this is the first time I've met you in person. And um, that really touched my heart. And um, I looked at Paul, and she also shared that it was the first time she and Paul had met in person. And I will share that I looked at Paul and said, I think you've grown four inches at least since last year. So um, it was a great feeling to be able to have some real in-person time. So thank um, you them for being willing to do that. Thank you guys for um, your report. Uh, because of our distancing, uh, do any directors have any questions or comments they want to make or ask of our student representatives? Nope. Yes, Brian. I look forward to uh, spending next week on the Hill with you. You're going to be amazing. Uh, we had a chance to talk and put our game plan together. And I've been communicating that to our other partners in the region. So we're looking forward to having that meeting with you as well. And I'm so glad to hear that you're going to be taking advantage of those meetings with the governor, the lieutenant governor, and the, the state superintendent. I think that'll be fantastic. So way to go. Way to represent. Yeah, I just wanted to say um, thank you for what you're doing in terms of the advocacy. And thank you also for the kind of kid's eye view of what it's like for the kids going back in, in hybrid mode. So thanks for that. All right, thank you guys so much. Um, next up on our agenda, we have Superintendent Update, Board Policy 1800 OE9, Communication and Support to the Board. So we have three topics um, for the board tonight. All are gonna be presented by our learning services team. So I am actually gonna turn it over to Fred to choose the order. I will just preface the three topics are um, summer school for this summer. I think uh, Dr. Rundle's gonna update you on that. Um, as you've all been aware, there was um, a ballot, I can't remember if it was last year or the year before, for schools to implement a sex education curriculum. And so NOVA has been doing that work and we'll update you on that. And then we are also going to update you on social emotional um, learning student surveys. We've done some of our own and we know that you've heard of some other ones out there. So we're going to give you an update on that as well. So Dr. Rundle, take it away. Great, thank you, Superintendent Koloski. Um, why don't we start with the summer school update um, quickly there. Uh, I'll start with uh, elementary and kind of going to middle school. We'll Nova, jump in on middle school where you want and then I'll hand, we'll hand it over to Jamie for the high school um, update uh, as well. And, and I'll add in a little bit about um, any other programming uh, and then we'll get to the main event with uh, Assistant uh, Director Nova Williams. So starting off with our elementary summer school program, uh, traditionally we've held a uh, three week summer school. It's generally been uh, right after 4th of July is when we started and then we'd wrap up by uh, late July. Um, we've had uh, two coordinators for the past several years who have been on board and doing a great job, uh, Leslie Sherrick and Stephanie John Lewis, and they'll be back again, helping to coordinate things with me again this year. Um, we did some thinking and reflecting after last year and also thinking about um, wanting to maintain some momentum. So we're going to start it uh, one week earlier than we typically have. Um, and so school will be out just a little bit under a week, and then we'll start our summer program for elementary. It will run our traditional morning program focusing on literacy and math, uh, and it will run five days a week for three weeks. We're looking at uh, some options, and uh, one of our uh, 
colleagues and paraeducators who's been with our program for many years, Tammy Hackett, is actually helping to head up some possibilities of some afternoon enrichment where our stu some students would be able to stay throughout the day and participate in things um, such as physical movement activities, uh, art, possibly some music, uh, coding, and some other fun activities. We're then looking at potentially extending it another two weeks beyond the core uh, and offering some more social emotional learning and, and some uh, groups. And so we're starting to put all of those plans together. We plan to host it at Northwood this year. We have found that the North End uh, is the best uh, uh, land spot for this program, um, mainly for families who are commuting or families who already live on the north end of the island. It also has the proximity of the Boys and Girls Club and many of the students who participate um, then can go to the Boys and Girls Club afterward if they use that uh, program for child care or other activities. Um, we'll also run our extended school year program for our elementary out of Northwood uh, and we'll run concurrent services uh, with that. And, and uh, last week, uh, Dr. Booby uh, and other members of our learning services team, uh, we gave a community webinar and we gave some of this information as well. So we're excited about the program. Um, we do have a fee-based structure, uh, which is unique to ours. Um, some school district, because of Title I funding, uh, have the capability to provide it completely free of charge. Um, unfortunately for us, we do have to do it uh, uh, Fee. However, uh, we do not let the fee get in the way of anyone participating. Um, we definitely have scholarships and uh, reduced tuition opportunities. Parents can expect to receive more information after spring break uh, once we've had a chance to look at our second trimester reporting uh, from our teachers and we start nominating students and start the invitation process. For the middle school, um, we started last year, I think NOVA was our first year uh, in many years where we actually offered that program. And I know we're in the early phases of development. Uh, last year was really focused on executive functioning skills embedded within literacy and social studies. Um, we are imagining what that's gonna look like this year. And I know we're in our early stages of planning there. Do you wanna add anything to that, NOVA? I mean, I would just add that I think we're hoping that we would be able to include math in that um, this summer. So we're looking to do that if possible. Great. And that program, um, we have not settled on whether or not that will be in-person or, um, uh, or online or hybrid. Uh, that's going to be part of the survey process when we start looking at that. So our elementary, we do hope to be in-person. Uh, that is the goal uh, to serve those students as much as possible in-person throughout the summer. Uh, Jamie, you want to talk a little bit about uh, high school? Great. So high school last year, we were able to serve twice as many students as we had served previously, um, just given the format. Um, and so we do want to make sure that we can continue to offer and meet the needs of as many students as possible. And so we are in the survey process going to be assessing whether or not students feel like they want to continue and do what we did last year, which was remote for summer school that provided some flexibility for students who previously were struggled with completing summer school due to the limitations of having to be on campus at least once a week um, and checking in. So they were able to travel, they were able to engage in work or camps, um, which increased our ability to serve more students because they didn't have those limitations. Um, but we also know that given it's a year now since students have been in school, um, we want to make sure that if there is a need that we can meet that need as well. And so part of the process in um, determining what will be offered will be based on student feedback and input. Um, and so we might end up with a hybrid where we may have some students who receive um, summer school instruction on site, some who receive it remotely, um, really trying to be responsive to student need. And I brought in uh, our director of special services, Sue Ann Booby. Sorry. Dr. Booby, I didn't realize that you were in the audience there. So I saw you there. So I wanted to bring you in and give you a chance just to talk a little bit about ESY. Yeah, so uh, we are working um, to uh, coordinate ESY with um, summer school. Some students, a lot of our students will be in person for, for ESY because that's students who 
really regress over long breaks and take a long time to recoup skills. Um, but we will be providing some uh, virtual options as well, and uh, we will be working with families to see which is more appropriate as um, as we get closer to the summer. And our goal is as soon as spring break hits, if we haven't already met with families, to start meeting with families to um, to solidify those that process. Great. Any questions from the school board for any of the four of us about uh, upcoming programming? Pam. Thanks, Fred. So here you mentioned that uh, typically the kids get nominated and invited. So that mean, I assume that there is a threshold that uh, teachers are thinking that if you know students need the extra help but during this time, I would, I would think that a lot of parents would think that their kids are needing help. And so what is our capacity or what is kind of your thinking of extending this to, um, you know, so how do we define who is in need for this moment? It's a great question. Um, we start and really try to focus on students that we're identifying who are most at risk of not meeting standard, um, especially in literacy and numeracy. Um, right now, we have a survey out to our entire uh, Mercer Island School District uh, staff and faculty um, seeking uh, anyone who's interested in teaching or supporting either ESY or summer school. Um, and so we'll be looking at staff capacity, certainly. Um, and uh, we've also started looking at what are some other options if we have to look at hiring substitute teachers if we don't have enough from our internal uh, staff who would like to do it. So it's a bit of um, a puzzle between staffing availability as well as what the student uh, needs are for those supports. Uh, and it really is kind of a evolving piece throughout the uh, spring. We do try to keep the, the numbers in our ratio of, of staff to students um, at a lower number, uh, just to provide that targeted intervention and support, uh, knowing that uh, there's always that piece of how do we balance between um, getting as many students in, but then also being able to really provide a good experience uh, that's gonna have a lot of return on their investment of time um, as well as ours. So um, it evolves over time, Director Din. It's a great question. We always try to serve as many as we can. Um, starting, we use our learning support teachers, our ELL teachers, um, our special education teachers, our classroom teachers. Everyone is part of the process um, to try to help identify and target students who we think um, are going to benefit. And, you know, we really kind of identify them almost like tiers of intervention who are our most significant um, students, and then who's in the next level and, a, and another level off after that. But we'll serve as many students as we can. I think it's also um, important to remember that we will still be having to abide by all the mitigation strategies. And so that dictates numbers and ratios as well. So a few more pieces to the puzzle this year as, as we um, determine how to run an in-person summer school. Great, thanks. I think uh, the other aspect of this, a couple other things would be interesting is uh, they're talking about vaccines will have be full availability starting May 1st for all adults. So that might change the mitigations uh, as well. And there's still more work being done on the three foot versus six foot rule as we've talked about. But I, uh, I, I also, uh, have the same concern Tam does uh, that there might be more students who are interested in summer school. And uh, this would be a great use for one one time funding that we get potentially. I know there's potential for one time funding from either the state or federal government um, and specifically targeted at helping uh, meet the gap students have um, for you know over the pandemic. So it might be interesting if that becomes available. I know we don't know that now, uh, but that might be something to look at too, to increase enrollment. You're absolutely right, um, Director D'Souza. The um, recovery plan that each school district um, will have to build that will address um, how we're going to certainly approach um, summer intervention as well as the fall will have um, potential 
dollars that we will be able to use. Um, you know, right now, the only dollars that we know that are coming to us are federal dollars, ESSER dollars, which are based on Title I, which we have a very, very low threshold for. So it's not the kind of dollars that um, folks think of um, when they see the big numbers that school that's being allocated to schools. Ty will talk a little bit more about that um, during the budget update, but absolutely that's one of the things that Ty and I have talked about is how do we, when we know what those dollars are, how do we allocate them to serve for scholarships, to um, serve for some expansion. Um, but I do want to remind everyone to Fred's point, it is a staffing piece as well. We know that everyone's um, pretty fatigued and pretty tired, but we're going to do our best to be able to staff for um, the needs and any expansion that we might be able to provide. But we'll keep you updated on that as well. Will there be a process for um, parents to indicate that they would like their children their child to receive these services as part of the selection and nomination process? Yep, our first kind of layer is um, we're targeting students um, based on uh, our uh, indicators and our assessments. And then once we have more room after that, then we open it up um, and then we um, start opening it up to other um, just more open nominations. The, when it does go live on the website though, um, families can register and put their names in as they would like to be considered. So we have um, a, a process through a Google form on the website um, that we launch usually the first week um, right after spring break. Any other questions or comments? I think the uh, other tension will be if vaccines are out in May timeframe, people having to decide whether they're staying home or not and all, all that type of thing will happen too. So some of these might be late decisions and the uptake might not be still hard to predict where it lands in the end too. So I, I appreciate, you know, how, you know, patience from parents as well as to how this will work out in the end as we try and understand the numbers. So again, I'll, as, as Deborah regularly calls for some grace from our parents, most appreciated as this, this uh, nets itself out. All right, I will turn it over to, uh, to Nova, uh, who's going to, as, you, as uh, Superintendent Koloski shared, talk a little bit about um, the survey uh, and SEL survey. Um, but also as her evaluator, I'm very anxious to see her present to the board on sexual education. So uh, I will be taking notes, Nova. <laughs> All right, well, I hope you're really excited to hear about it. I've heard so, lots of comments this week from um, teachers that I've invited to meetings that it's at least the most interestingly titled meeting that we've had in a long time. Um, so the first update that we're gonna go through is just the sexual health education requirements, the current existing, and then what will be required over the course of the next couple of years. So I've kind of taken it in segments. That's how they've outlined it in the bill is by these segments. So in kindergarten and third grade, currently there's no expectation of this type of instruction. And beginning in the school year that starts in 2022, they're saying that um, schools need to provide social emotional learning. So I've also delineated there for you what we already do um, and what we need to do. So what we already do is SEL education. So we've already got that, which is fantastic and exciting that we won't have to take that on. Uh, but what I think we have to do is clarify that the content choices we've made are the right content choices for our students. So we'll have to do a little bit of that and just solidify our communication plan for families so that families are aware of what we're talking about with kids uh, and can make appropriate decisions for their family. Fourth and fifth grade, the current expectation is that uh, we, they require HIV STD training or teaching um, on the prevention of no later than fifth grade. So it could really happen in fourth or fifth grade. What we currently do is we use the flash materials that are provided by King County. Um, and human relations media, there's a, a video tool that we use with students during that lesson where they have a conversation about that. Beginning in 2022, schools have to provide comprehensive sexual education no later than fifth grade. 
And uh, there's really not a lot of specific specificity in this, um, but we so we need to confirm the topic coverage that we're covering what they want us to cover via the standards. So we have to kind of look back at those and ensure that we are covering it. They do call out the HIV AIDS prevention um, still in the bill. So we are meeting that need. And then any updated materials. Uh, several years ago, we updated the materials by adding in that HIV AIDS video. We had a previous video, which was older in the sense that it was on VHS. So <laughs> um, that should tell you enough to know that it was pretty old in its age. And there's a lot of new information that's coming out um, in the last several years. So we wanna make sure that we're providing the right, most accurate and most current information to kids. So we'll update that. And again, solidify our communication plan to families. The teachers in those grades already communicate that to the families pretty clearly because it's a, a generally, generally a sensitive topic for kids. Sixth through eighth grade, uh, our current instruction, um, it looks like part of my slide dropped off here. So the only, this did not follow over. Okay, um, so that first side is incorrect. I don't know why, but um, currently the expectation is that they have health instruction in middle school. So they already do have health instruction. We have one required course in middle school where they get that. They have another option later on in school to take health, um, health curriculum, but they don't necessarily cover, um, they cover all of the topics, but they don't cover it twice, which is the new requirement. So beginning in 2021, so next school year, we have to have two touch points for students in comprehensive sexual education. So that is new. Previously, we just had the one required touch point, and now we have to come up with a second touch point. I've already been speaking with uh, West and Lucas at the middle school, and we've already been having some conversations about what this might look like and talking to their existing health teachers as well to talk a little bit about where might we be able to pull that in. They used to do extra content in um, grade level courses in eighth grade. They used to do a sort of a unit, a, a mini unit of sorts where they talked about a lot of this content. So we may revisit doing something like that, um, but still very early in the conversation there. Oops. All right, in ninth through 12th grade, um, we have the current expectation is that they are required to have the HIV STD prevention. They do have a health component to that as well that has to start um, in fifth grade and continue through high school. What we have in the high school, same as the middle school, is we use the FLASH curriculum, uh, again, adopted by King County. So it's accessible and free to our teachers uh, in fifth through 12th grade. And that includes the content that meets the requirements as they exist right now. Going forward into next school year, it's the same as the middle school. We need to have a second touch point that is required for our kiddos. So that's where the change happens for high school as well. So they already have an existing requirement to take a variety of health course over the course of their ninth through 12th grade year. So that's one time. So they get that content that one time. In speaking with the biology teachers and uh, the health and image teachers, there are other places where they cover some of that content, but we just need to, to make sure that they're covering all of it in the way that the state wants us to do that. So we do have to cover all of the bits and pieces associated with the standards, or at least the outlined uh, topics that the bill states. And so we'll have to update any materials that might come along with that, uh, make sure that we're communicating to families the options. Of course, already in health and image, they're communicating that to families to provide them the opportunity to opt out. So we've got some ideas and we're starting to work together as a small team to come up with a plan for how to do that. Um, met with them this afternoon to discuss a little further. Do you want me to go into the second update, Donna, or do you want to provide an opportunity for questions on that first? Let's stop and do questions on that part before we move into the, the next part. Does the board have any questions for Nova on the um, sexual health education? Yeah, I'm just curious what the rationale is for having the two touch points that you described, like kind of covering the same material twice. What's the idea behind that? I'd like to be able to answer it thoroughly. I can speculate that they want to provide multiple points of exposure to kids. Um, the bill originally was uh, signed and then later became something that we all voted on in November. So it was actually a pretty quick turnaround time when they officially, officially passed it in November and we had to um, start planning in December. So we started looking through the requirements, but I speculate it's really just about exposure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Is the uh, Flash curriculum available for parents' inspection if they wish? Since you said it's adopted by King County, is it on a website or something? It's not. So you have to have a school district email account in order to get access to their digital materials. But teachers in their letters home in the existing content and curriculum provide information about what is covered topics wise. Uh, certainly, I think a teacher would be willing to have a, for a deeper conversation with a parent if they were interested in doing so. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, just to jump in there. So um, I know that Senator Claire Wilson was one of the, the people um, pushing this forward. She's a former school board director and I worked with her across over on legislative committee. As a committee, we've been observing this from the get go and it's been quite controversial um, and, and unnecessarily so um, because the heart of the bill is really fairly simple. And as far as a district like Mercer Island, it's very much on par which, with what was already pretty much happening in Mercer Island. So it expands it a little bit. Um, as parents, as this may be discovering this first time and it may be raising the hair on the back of their neck uh, before anyone gets too nervous or concerned, who can they reach out to to get some just solid answers and direction as to where they can look at these things? Um, uh, because I, I know it gets very confusing when you delve into OSPI and, and different things there and what is said and what's not said. So for folks who have questions about this, what's the best place for them to go and ask those questions? Because they're all great questions. Yeah. I think that the starting place for any type of question is really the teacher who's teaching the content to the kids. Um, when in, in particular, I would suggest that they wait until the, when they do receive the information saying we're, we're going to start this unit because that's the most timely and really the most appropriate um, point to ask the teachers about that content. So that would be my suggestion first off, but I think that it, it would be advantageous for us to have a place that answers some of those questions in a general sense. So that's part of our plan, but we have to develop kind of the whole plan first before we get any of that out there. Once we do, I think we'll have, we have a repository of sorts already where we post things about our curriculum that we use. And so we'll post additional information there for families. That's kind of generic in nature, but provides them at least enough to know what topics. I wholly agree that, uh, and I think the teachers would agree those at least that I've been speaking with at the high school are very excited that this is in place and that they think it's the right move for our students. So it's not so it's not so far off from what we already do. So I don't want to panic anyone. It's really not that far off from what we already do. All right, update two. <laughs> Okay, so our S SEL survey and OSPI survey um, versus the CEE survey. So I spoke a couple of weeks ago about the CEE survey and some of the data that we've gotten. Nova, will you break down the acronyms really quickly? Yes. Well, SEL, social emotional learning. The CEE is the survey that we spoke about a couple of weeks ago. That's the Center for Educational Effectiveness. That is the same company or organization that runs the EES survey, the Educational Effectiveness Survey. And so they provided us and a survey for social emotional learning so that we could monitor the progress of our social emotional well being of our students over the course of the school year. So I'm going to give you kind of a general overview. I know that there have been questions in the community around why are we not doing the OSPI survey. So I'm going to attempt to answer that for you, and I think this will give folks some history. In the summer of 2020. OSPI produced a document about reopening, which had some requirements in reopening. Regardless of how we were reopening, there were requirements that we had to abide by in order to do so. So one of those requirements that we had to attest to and sign off on was that we were going to screen for social emotional wellness of our students in K-12, which is a pretty big lift since that's not something that school districts had done in the past. As uh, a response to that, we already had an assessment learning forward team that we were working with that was talking about the academic side of things and what, how we were going to screen for that, which is the other requirement that they listed in there for assessment. So we began to think about assessment academic side and then we branched off to have an additional group that was just focused on the SEL component of that because that involves very different people than the people who are focusing on the academic side of thing, things. So we had, um, administrators and we had some of our youth and family services folks join us in, some counselors. And we talked about the requirement that OSPI had and that we had to attest to it. And we really had a moral obligation to check in on our students and see where they were. 
So we discussed the option that was presented to us from the Center for Educational Effectiveness, and we made a plan for implementation. So all of that occurred over the course of July and August in 2020. Then in fall through winter of 20 and 21, we implemented the screening in the fall for our K-5 students that was done asynchronously. And then our eighth, ninth and 10th grade students were assessed uh, synchronously in their respective classes. And we also have plans moving forward to do the same for our sixth, 11th and 12th grade students here in the coming weeks. And then everyone will be rescreened again in the spring, May, June. Then in February of 2021, OSPI produced a survey and offered that via an announcement, I think on uh, February 26th. By February 26th, we were neck deep in SEL data and our current survey. Um, and so we, did, we chose to continue along our trajectory and not use another survey on top of the one we were already using. Um, so why are we continuing on that path? Again, we've already committed our money and our time and our energy to move toward this. Um, what our survey, the survey that we're using right now provides us to drill down to student level data based on the questions that they've answered, the schools that they're in, the demographics that they've identified. So there's lots of different ways we can look at that data. OSPI survey is anonymous and does not provide that data. It provides a school-based data, um, which doesn't provide us the same way to support kids. So something I think is really important to mention is that in the survey that we're giving to kids right now, Kids have at the, in part of the survey, they have an opportunity to flag when they have a particular need, whether that be with food, safety, mental health, technology, what have you. I think that's important to mention because then we know which students have asked for that and we can seek them out and try to support them. That is not something the OSPI survey allows us to do. And in a time like right now, I think it's super important that our counselors have the data and be able to address those concerns with students individually uh, in a safe space. So that's really important. Nova, I also learned, I don't even think we had a chance to connect on this, but in a uh, presentation by Superintendent Reichdahl this week, um, he was uh, really urging districts to use the tool, um, but it's not mandatory. Um, it's just uh, a uh, recommendation that OSPI is providing However, he also shared that the results from that particular instrument won't be available to school districts until June at the earliest, which means any planning that districts are going to be doing. So again, um, I think the team that uh, you helped lead to pull together our social emotional learning screening uh, positions us to be able to have um, data that we're going to be able to have take action on sooner as part of our recovery plan. So just another element of why I think we're on a good path. Thanks. Yeah, I agree. I think it's uh, it's definitely the right choice that we've made. I feel that, you know, there are challenges with giving a survey in an asynchronous environment or in a virtual environment. But honestly, I think the data will really help us in the end. And it's something that I think will be really important for us as we progress forward. So um, that's why we've made the decision we've made. And I think it's the right one. Any questions about that part before I do another survey update? I can share with the board that um, in talking with superintendent co colleagues, many have chosen to go the same route that we have. They also engaged with the CEE on this social emotional survey and they, um, are say, staying the course just as we are. So um, I'm not sure how many will be participating in the OSPI, but again, as Fred said, it's, an, it's optional, it's not mandated. And um, we just strongly feel that it's more important to meet the needs of our students here versus providing a, a huge bank of data that really won't be a, help us to serve our students. And the last one then um, from Nova is a, an inquiry that you had as a school board at your most recent um, study session where we were discussing um, Fundamental Four. And you, we had talked to you a little bit about the high achieving school survey. Uh, and there was interest uh, from uh, the five of you just to get a little better sense of what the high achieving schools uh, survey might offer. And so we asked uh, Nova to come uh, this evening and provide you with just a uh, uh, 
overview of this, we can bring it back to another study session, but since we'll also be talking about this later on in the meeting, um, we, would thought, we thought we would front load you with some information about this instrument. Um, just to refresh your memories or memory, um, we have been using the asset survey and we're looking to um, replace that with potentially this tool. And then we've also been using the EES. Um, and so we're trying to figure out what's the right um, uh, methodology in terms of either replacing all instruments or where we put this in. So Nova, if you'll give us an overview on authentic connections and the Haas. Yeah. So I'll just say that um, I kind of set up on the slides here and I'll reduce it so that you can see the bigger of the high achieving school survey here momentarily. But as Fred mentioned, we do the EES every year and then we do the asset and healthy youth on alternating years. So those kind of go back and forth. So one of the things we're trying to look for is the right data. Um, that seems to be the target that we're continuing to do or continuing to look for. What I think that I'll just say in this, um, in our work, sorry, let me pause and reshare the right thing here. I think that as we're trying to find when we as we went through the SEL survey, what we learned is that that data was actually really useful. So that's one of the things I personally think we need to make sure that we find something that gives us a bit more of. And so that's one of our targets as we look for something, whatever that tool might be, that it provides us a little bit more information uh, than what our other surveys do. So I'm just gonna give you kind of a quick overview of what they sent to me in terms of information that's on that survey and the survey that they do offer a survey to uh, students, staff and parents as well. And their surveys really start in second grade potentially all the way up to 12th. So you can see the breakdowns in the categories off to the side here and then they give you um, the general kind of topic, the number of items that are attached to that and then example items, make this a little bit bigger so that hopefully you can see it. So this is the first page, I'll give you a moment to just peruse that. One of the things you'll see at the bottom of this page is the idea that there's a free response. One, that's something that's very different from our existing surveys in, in, um, in that kids have an opportunity to respond in written form in, at the end of the survey. They have an opportunity to talk about things. And then they sort we, of, uh, go ahead. Sorry, uh, do we think about, uh, you know, in a 360, there's feelings about school that potentially be feelings about home life, feelings about my peers. Do we look at that? Yeah, so there's more information. So the categories continue. So we've got a school climate here. Um, this one gives us a lot about the teachers, sort of how they feel as an individual in our system. You can see sort of that common thread from the, the high achieving element, right? The overcommitment, perceptions of schoolwork. And then we get into the peer and parent bit. This is definitely different, at least from the EES, you know, a lot of what we see students being asked. There's obviously, if you also think about the other fundamentals, um, you can also start to already map some of these questions, or I have been in my own mind about where they might map. And Superintendent Kolaski and I were talking about this the other day that, um, you know, it's not just exclusively fundamental four, but there would be other tie-ins to this as well. I skipped over several pages just because there are other surveys they offer that are shorter uh, versions of the longer one. Uh, but what is also helpful here too, is just that they have this, when we think about our youngest learners who might be taking this, that that's read by the teacher. Um, there is this visual guide of sorts. This is somewhat similar to the current SEL tool that we're using where there is sort of a visual indicator of what 
answer they're giving. This so, one, sorry, Nova. No. <laughs> Just to, to reference what, what Fred was sharing as, as I was going through this and reading through it and looking at the components of it, I actually thought there were um, a lot of pieces that the board might want to look at and staff would actually recommend to look at as we're monitoring fundamental three, which is really um, focused on our, our social emotional learning and um, potentially fundamental five on um, diversity, equity, and inclusion, because I think a lot of these responses would give us a sense of how our, how our students are, are feeling. Um, new fundamental four, I'm not sure how much would be here, but we can talk about that later when we get to um, the indicators for that. But um, as we were talking about it and looking through the monitoring reports, we, were also, we also talked a little bit about uh, fundamental one with personalized learning and potentially where there's some questions in here that um, might be useful as indicators. So we're in pretty early stages just of looking at this survey and having conversations with them. Um, learning more, I just wrote her an email back today. So hopefully we'll get some more information about it as well. I asked her to kind of take a glance at our fundamentals to just sort of think about since she has the broader context of all of the questions that she'll have a better sense about where those things connect and intersect. And I think we do and, need to be cognizant about over surveying. Um, we do do the e ES every year and it's pretty lengthy. Um, and so if we don't just wanna pile on, if we're going to add on, what are we going to um, perhaps move off the plate so that um, students really do understand um, and do authentically respond in the survey. So our, our data is as, as clean as we can get it. Does it help us with uh, fundamental five around diversity and equity as well, as well? It looks like it. Yeah, so they do have some of that in here. And really this, this school climate, uh, it has a chunk of that. Uh, and then the students also do some like, demographic identification in terms of like what gender I identify with as opposed to sort of kind of forcing them into a birth gender. Um, I have a question. Um, I mean, I agree with you guys in terms of um, not wanting to kind of go backwards to use the OSPI um, survey. But I guess I'm wondering, um, how much of a burden would it be to do that also in the sense of I'm quite certain that Superintendent Reichdahl is hoping to use that data to uh, convince our legislators that perhaps modifying the prototypical school model um, would be beneficial for our students. Um, and I'm just wondering if we, I mean, do we give them, do we give the state our the results of our surveys. I mean, I, I just want to make sure that we're, I mean, I know he has an agenda in a way that supports our kids. And I just want to make sure that we're supporting that also. Yeah, I think that's a really great question about whether or not we can give our results. We won't give our uh, precise results because they're drilled down to the students, of course, but um, I don't know if there will be an opportunity for us to provide our existing data. They did ask school districts to put in a survey and I, I, you know, part of it may be that they've developed this survey because it has been challenging for some of our really small districts, for example, in Eastern Washington or districts that are struggling with finances to be able to provide a survey. And so they may have developed it for that in part to help meet the requirement and give them some data. I don't disagree with you that I think it's probably usable data at the state level. Uh, in terms of how easy it would be to add in an, another survey, I can say that the survey we're using right now is a pretty big lift. Um, and so the idea of doing another one for counselors and students might feel a little burdensome, um, but I can look into whether or not that's something we could provide overarching data to the state to supplement their need for that. Nova? Can you give us a link to where the OSPI survey is at? It doesn't, I have not been able to find the actual survey itself. All I found was a bulletin. So we got a bulletin in February of the survey and then a place to sign up for it. Fred, do you have that link 
by any chance? Um, we have to register. So each school district in order to get any access actually has to register formally with the state um, to get access. I think I recall seeing an email actually, and I'll just have to dig it up where they gave a few sample questions and I can find that and forward to Superintendent Koloski um, of what I have with some of those. But in terms of ac access to the actual instrument, um, that hasn't been provided uh, widely. Because I do agree that um, there's a danger of over-serving and if the information is useful or not, uh, from what Nova you're saying that is anonymous without any demographic information, um, that doesn't sound really good to me in being able to tease apart the data. And so then is the purpose to really inform us or is the purpose to, yeah, I would like to know more of the purpose of the OSPI survey first before we make any decision. But right. I don't like the fact that it is, that we can't be like, it's just like, well, how is Mercer Island doing? Well, that's. And of course, all that information wasn't shared with us. I think the survey was part of, we've asked districts to do this, so we, we should provide something. The bit of a preview that we were able to see of some of the topics um, seemed to, some many of the questions seem to be pulled directly from the um, Healthy Youth Survey, which we do do um, every other year. We didn't do it this year, correct, Nova? We're due up next year for it. Um, and that's a pretty extensive survey. We don't give it to as many students. We target specific grades in it, but that is a survey that um, you as a board use for some of your indicators. And it, it does give a lot of that data that you're able to access on a much broader scale um, statewide. So we do always participate in that and do intend to still participate in that, but it's an every other year survey. So we would always have access to um, that data and um, OSPI could use that as well as something to move forward to say, here's where our kids were pre-pandemic, now that we've done it again after, here's our concerns um, post as how much of things have changed because many of the questions were pretty similar to that one. Okay. I can just say that in the bulletin, it says the goal of the survey is to provide you with critical and timely data about your students' health, well-being, and life and learning experiences during the COVID-19 pandemic. Questions are meant to be actionable, providing you with information to support implementation of school-wide supports for your students. Any other questions or comments? Um, can I quickly ask Morgan and Paul, since you guys are the ones that sit in the classroom and fill out these surveys? Um, what, I mean, I know you guys have talked about it in your superintendent's advisory, but kind of what are your general experiences with, um, with taking all these surveys and understanding the purposes of them? Um, I certainly think that there's a fatigue of like, I mean, there, there's too many surveys that I, like, you can have too many surveys, but I feel like they're also a way to get anonymous data. And I do feel like students fill out them truthfully. Um, and I think that that's an, it is an effective way to get students to, to tell the truth. I feel like you do have students that just fill them out as quickly as possible. Um, so I feel like every, everything that you get from it, you have to take it with a grain of salt a little bit, but, but overall, I feel like it's, it's mostly truthful. Yeah, I think Paul pretty much summed it up, but I, I agree that the an anonymity aspect of it um, definitely makes it more effective. Um, yeah, like as opposed to an Islander hour discussion in a class when several students wouldn't feel comfortable sharing their personal thoughts or opinions. Uh, that's definitely like a pro of, a, of the survey. Uh, However, sometimes I guess they don't feel as connected or as personal, uh, which is also a, a, a con to them. Thanks guys. Anyone else? All right. Um, are, are, are we done with this part? What are next steps? <laughs>
I'm all done with my part. <laughs> okay, so is, um, I mean, I know this is presentation to the board. So you're, are you looking for guidance? In we are not, we, we okay. just, as we work through these indicators and um, with the fundamentals now um, more condensed and more specific, we know that there's going to be <clears throat> suggestions for um, indicators in the others as well. Once we get four done, there could be, you know, could we add this or could we add that? Um, you know, staff does have a concern about over surveying, so we don't want to just add another one on. So that's why we're giving you this information so you can kind of see what's available um, and what's going to be the best tool for you to use for, as indicators as we're monitoring and making progress in our fundamentals, but also allows um, staff the tools that we need to make adjustments um, as Nova noted with the SEL one, we've had been, a been able to drill down to the student level and reach out to support individual students, but it also helps us as we're guiding um, our decisions about instruction and curriculum and um, supporting teachers as well. So how do we find, how do we find the, the, the best mix of all of these tools is, is I think where we're heading next. No decisions right. tonight, but some things to consider as we move forward. And all of them also have a cost as well. So that's something we need to, to keep in mind too. Great, thank you. Um, so, uh, well, so I, let me just take the pulse. It's 7.25. Um, we still have quite a bit to go. Do you guys wanna take a break now or you wanna push through till about eight o'clock or? No one's like jumping up and down for a break. So let's, let's go in. And um, that, that's kind of what I look for. Um, so moving on to full governance process monitoring board policy 1800 OE1 fundamental four analytical critical thinking for global awareness, selection of indicators first reading. So this is definitely a first reading. We had our study session for this just on Thursday. And um, at that time, I told the board we would we would do our best to present a very rough, and it is rough, <laughs> draft to what staff um, is recommending for some of the indicators here. Um, Fred, do you want to open the document? Sure. Or not? <laughs> yep. Just give me one sec. So just a reminder, the fundamental four now reads, engage students in analytical and critical thinking in order to identify and address global concerns. And at our study session, as we were looking at the, um, the superintendent interpretation, we talked about some themes that um, we could maybe break this down to. Some of them are similar to what we had when we had fundamentals four, five, and six, but we made that a little more concise. So the first theme being critical and analytical thinking skills. These are indicators we previously used for this, this same theme. And some of these are, as we showed you in the study session the other day, um, where we were looking uh, at the actual uh, data sets from the EES. Um, some of these questions are directly out of there, particularly with the critical thinking, um, the creative thinking. And so these are ones we've already been polling um, for several years. And the same with the second theme, which we um, described as creative and cross-discipline thinking, which is part of the interpretation. These are also from the EES. So there are certain questions that we've pulled for the monitoring of, um, I believe it was, what was the old five? I, I don't wanna mix up the numbers too much. Um, same idea, we disaggregated out by grade level. This is the survey that we do fourth through 12th grade. It is a, it's a fairly intense survey and we have been doing it every year. So we've been, contemplating that, um, do we do an alternate year piece and how does that impact the data um, as we're using it for um, the work of the board as well as the, the, the staff work. And then the last theme um, focused on the global citizenship piece. 
And you can see there were some questions here that had already been determined to be part from the EES that were already determined to be part of the indicators. And then we added two more uh, so far in our cursory look uh, since meeting together um, of a couple others that might apply as well when we start thinking about that global uh, citizenship and uh, overall thinking. So we added two possibilities as well. And those are from the EES. So they're, they're yeah. ones that we would have um, access to and we, we could go back and call out data from previous years because we do have it. The other um, conversation we had was around um, what coursework might we want to be looking at either for participation um, or um, many, how many years are students participating? In, how are students having access to the themes as mentioned? And so this is a, a kind of initial listing um, of possible courses that, and the themes that we thought that they would interrelate with. Questions, comments? Brian? Thank you. Um, yeah, when I was looking at the um, section around global citizenship, I was I was wanting left wanting a little bit more in there uh, about that. Um, so I did a little digging. You know how I love rabbit holes. Um, I pulled up a few questions from the PISA 2018 Global Competence Questionnaire. It's at OECD.org, um, and something that came up there I thought was interesting was a question. Um, I sometimes try to understand my friends better by uh, imagining how things might look from their perspective. Um, so something that that looks at how students are looking at things from somebody else's perspective, I think is a great way that leads to global citizenship because we have to be able to look at issues from another culture's perspective, the needs of another group outside of ourselves. Um, so I, maybe something around that. Um, another one from, there was an article uh, on four questions about global, global citizenship, uh, a necessity, not a luxury from the University of Arizona. Um, and it had three areas uh, about um, considering our own cultural identities. So maybe a question around, are you taking time to consider your own cultural identity? Um, a question specifically around reading historical fiction about events in other parts of the world. So maybe a question around the curriculum there of, are we reading things from multi-perspective and multi-cultures around the world. And the last one I thought was interesting could be a question around looking at intercultural action, which would be um, exploring taking, taking action in the world. So are you, can you see using what you're learning here in order to take action somewhere else in the world? I, just some things that kind of popped up in my digging that might be useful to fill in maybe one or two more questions that addresses how students see themselves in the world and how they can navigate the world or see themselves making an impact in the world. So for me, that fits into that global citizenship question. Tam? Um, can I just, I'm sorry, I'll get right there. Um, Brian, that was great information. Could you email it to me? Yes, absolutely. You were taking copious notes, but we're not that fast. So if you could email <laughs> us, that would, that would ease our digesting of it. Thank you. I'm still trying to let band and orchestra and everyone else into the meeting. I mean, you know. <laughs> and I, I think I'm listening to drumline every time I turn on on my, my mic. I'm like, can you guys hear the drumline? I think they're out there. They're playing. <laughs> Sorry, Director Din. No problem. No, I agree with uh, Brian. And I think that um, we are, we're a little bit light on identify and address global concerns. I don't see is represented here as much. And similar on the same uh, align with what Brian is saying. 
it's like, how do we, you know, are our students aware that there are other issues uh, outside of Mercer Island? So what kind of questions can we ask? We don't want to name the issues, right? Like, are you, are you aware of like climate change or all these things? But are they aware that maybe other communities, other uh, countries have different issues, right? Um, are they aware that um, how, um, that we are all kind of connected and so, so those kind of like, or do you want to go, you know, how do you see yourself in this global world? So I, I feel like, uh, because when, when we put here to identify and to address, I don't think that the current, I, um, what we're asking will get us that information. So, um, but I'm sure what Brian sent you, it would dig more into that. And also the cross culture, the interdisciplinary, um, I kind of want to also see, when I think of interdisciplinary, I see that students are able to sit, uh, able to connect to very different ideas or to very different topics, to different fields. You know, can they take these two di very different perspectives and uh, come to term with it, make something new out of it? Um, that's kind of more of an interdisciplinary for me. And I don't really see that. Um, I see the creative, uh, you know, measured in here, but I don't see the interdis the cross discipline thinking as much. I think that I, I don't disagree with that at all, and I think part of this is to what degree, um, as a board and for future boards, do you want to see this in a in a quantitative manner, and then in what ways do you want to see it in the qualitative um, exemplars that we bring to you um, and. Uh, maybe even defining what the parameters around that qualitative piece. I mean, I can even look through the attendees tonight and look at a number of our staff members and think, oh, I've seen in their class them doing this or that. And so um, I think that's an element too that, you know, this is just the quantitative, but um, do we, we can continue looking for more quantitative or do we also want to think about the qualitative? So um, just a thought. And in any report are, um, how we would uh, align the report would be those qualitative items would also be within the same themes. Yeah. So that would be um, something that we would really attend to when working with the school sites as to make sure that we're that you're really covering each of these themes as we're gathering those um, qualitative items. And so for me, I guess when the quantitative uh, data, it shows more of a sy uh, system change so the qualitative, you know, will show us how, right? And that different teachers are doing different things. Um, and, you know, we don't have, I, I'm just thinking maybe, you know, in the theme two, maybe just another question about cost uh, discipline thinking and in the global citizens, uh, a little bit like at least two or three more very specific on how are they able to identify and address. Uh, that's kind of missing. But um, I would like to see uh, both Fred. <laughs> Because, you know, the quality, you know, it, it gives me like as a whole system, are we moving forward? And the, the uh, that's a quantitative and the qualitative is like, wow, how awesome are our teachers in all the different things that they're doing and how it uh, and how it's different within uh, each grade. Um, yeah. I feel like it's not so much a question of whether whether students know about, you know, global issues now. It's more like, like clearly they know there are such things. You know? um, it's more like, do you feel your learning skills that will enable you to kind of go out in the world and address these issues, you know, after graduation? And I'm not, I'm not really sure. I don't have a great answer as to what that question would be that would get at that, but it, it would be nice to have a little bit of quantitative data on that year after year to go along with, I'm sure what will be lovely examples of, of qualitative things that are happening in the schools. But, um, but, but I do think that that's, that's more the question is sort of um, like, do you feel like your learning skills for advocating slash problem solving slash, you know, developing technology to, to help address these kinds of, of larger issues? That's not very helpful. <laughs> Just sharing my perspective. I've been thinking about that too, uh, Director Tucker, in that, you know, about six or seven years ago, um, we did start to do some graduate, some graduate surveys in terms of trying to look at our seniors and then 
track them over time. And it, it really became difficult, even with the company that we had contracted with to track down students. However, there are some other instruments out there. Um, and, you know, I'm familiar with a couple of them that might be better and sharper tools that link back to this, particularly for our seniors um, that really get at what you're talking about. And I think it loops back to kind of that civic minded graduate. Do we have students who are leaving who are civically minded? Um, and if so, to what degree did their four years at the high school or six or um, uh, their 612 experience or whatnot shape that? Um, and there are some tools out there that I'm aware of. So I will dig those up. We'll do some um, discuss, we'll discuss that too. And then we can bring those um, back. And many of them are free, of, they're free, they're just available. So we can look at that as well. That'd be great. Thank you. One thing that um, they, they, I, I really appreciate the comments starting with, you know, from Brian and, and then to Tim and Maggie Ty, because that's kind of where my head's been going. And um, one thing that I think we're um, not taking advantage of is the, I mean, and it could for, come from the quantitative, but qualitative, sorry. Um, it could come from there, but um, you know, we have made a concerted effort in the last several years to bring in literature um, that doesn't necessarily look like, uh, that hopefully that looks like more students and, and you know, it's, it expands our students' global views of, um, of people. And, um, you know, I'm speaking specifically Enrique's journey in terms of, of his journey from, um, I know it wasn't Mexico, but through Mexico, Central America through Mexico to um, try to get to the United States. And, um, you know, and goes, you know, there's, there's, there's other, recent adoptions of literature that hopefully are opening our students' eyes to the world around us and that they can learn to empathize or, or are learning to empathize with what, a, you know, a different kind of struggle and then and then can somehow equate, um, you know, that even if our, even if most of our students are not, you know, jumping on trains to try and get into the United States, how, how can they, like what, what uh, adventure or what you know, challenge that they have in their life that that is similar to that, or, or how can they empathize with that? I don't know how to ask that, but I just feel like we've made this concerted effort to broaden our students' minds in that way, um, that if we can see if we're, you know, having any impact on them in that way, I don't have a good suggestion, but that's just what kind of keeps going through my head. Honduras. Thank you. And it was... I think we all jumped to that literature selection because we have been really making a concerted mm -hmm. effort to expand um, the authors and the characters that our students are experiencing um, at the middle school and the high school. Um, and as I was thinking about it, I thought, oh, those are gonna come up in the vignettes. Those are gonna sure. be a big part of the qualitative. But I was spinning a little bit in my head of do we, I mean, it's only a, this is what our kids are being exposed to. It might not answer the question as to what their thinking is, but is it a metric to say, here's um, the representations that are in our in these literature selections over these years and, and um, use that as a metric for this within the global citizenship. It's, I'm, I'm not sure how much information it would give us, but at least it would show that um, our curriculum is adjusting. I, I like Deborah's line of thought. I was kind of going down that same direction too. Um, it feels like the question would be is maybe, can I empathize with someone else's problem and immerse myself in solving it, even though it doesn't affect me, right? And I think it's, it, it really is that part of solving someone else's problem. And in many cases, even the, the statement you know, is school relevant to me? Uh, well, you know, not everything has to be relevant to you. You could also be solving someone else's issue. So I think the empathy and put walking in someone else's shoes might be a big piece of that. And to the degree that our, our qualitative, um, you know, curriculum exposes kids to that, you know, and then maybe over time we figure out what the right quantitative questions are that show that systemic movement. I mean, clearly this is a crawl, walk, run type of program we're doing, 
And we're moving from the idea that languages, that a language exposes kids to the global culture to maybe our curriculum needs to be broader. You know, it's, it still surprises me how many people give their own lived experiences as reasons to do something. Uh, and that kind of does neglect the, the global perspective around this. And we want to change that a little bit. And I see the global perspective is like beyond the US, but also global just mean like larger community problems. Like you all are saying that it's not the U, it's like other issues. Um, and Donna, I don't know if you, uh, if you, when I heard you said the metrics for the books, I don't know you're on the same track, but when you said that, it made me think about, are we asking for through all the grades, you know, right now, 20% of our reading materials are from, let's say, BIPOC authors or about stories about others, right? And so I think that would be a really super awesome metric to put in and to give us uh, goals, you know, like every year, how do we raise from 20 to 30, 40% of making sure that our reading materials are reflective of you know global issues, you know community, larger community issues about you know things that are happening to other people. But that would be a wonderful metric, um, very quantitative, but very easy. Uh, you know, it's, I think it's easier to uh, to measure. Yeah, I I just wrote down, um, and this isn't perfect. It's just uh, like a. a metric when I learn of someone else's struggle or life experience I learn from that or you know in some I don't I, I don't like that I learn from that but um you know I'm it, able to learn from others life from reading about others life experiences something like that I like that yeah to tag on what um Gregor Tucker just said it doesn't always have to be a struggle but we can learn from celebrations and grand achievements from cultures other than ourselves so I think avoiding instilling that, that savior complex in our students that it's not always about solving problems in other cultures. Sometimes other cultures are looking at us and our problems, wondering how they can solve for us. So it's recognizing the strengths and weaknesses um, uh, of a, a broad swath of people, whether it's regionally, when you think globally, as uh, Director Din was saying, um, when we think in our own area or whether it's across the, the globe. Um, every time that we have a deeper understanding of humanity and how it maps out differently for each of us, the more we're able to participate in life and appreciate um, the nuances. Yeah. Anything else? I really appreciate um, Director D'Souza's comments about the crawl, walk, run, like we're in the beginning phases of this. And a reminder that as part of your process, um, we can add um, and we can take away because we've done that too, where we said, this isn't really that valuable anymore. Let's take away that, but let's add this. And I think that there's a, re a reminder for that, that um, the, the indicators and the metrics are serve a purpose for the board to see that their fundamentals, their student-focused fundamentals are, um, have, a, have a sense of accountability that we are working towards um, getting a better understanding of them. I think they'll always be ongoing. Um, it's always, there's always a, a, another space to go to. So um, this is a great starting point. I'm so glad Learning Services team was here because I know they were all taking copious notes. If you have any notes that you could send to me, we'd appreciate that because then that helps backfill ours. Um, and I think that um, we'll, we'll bring um, something back to you at the next meeting. Not sure if it will still be in the, in the, it'll be a little less rough draft, but hopefully it will again, generate some conversation um, as to um, next, next steps. But thank you very much. Fred, did you have any other questions or? Nope. Uh, yeah. We've been uh, connecting already, putting together some ideas. So we will be ready to go next time. Great. Thank you all. I'm curious if we had a chance to hear from our students on that and some input from them. Paul, Morgan, do you, um, do you guys have any comments on 
I mean, I just, I know that I can name a number of um, worldly books that I've read in the past few years, which I think really says something. Um, and so I, I think you've done a really good job of incorporating that into our classes because every year there's been um, at least a couple books from around the world um, that I've found really important. Yeah, I, I've noticed a con concerted effort as well. I think that uh, at times it could, it, it seems like uh, possibly like individual teachers going out of the, going out of their way. And, but I think uh, in the coming years, it's becoming a trend and it's across the board. I've seen an improvement. We've certainly seen books come through the instructional materials committee um, quite a bit through our English language arts uh, in, uh, department 612. Uh, and then I know there's a number of resources being used as supplementary texts. I know our social studies department is really taking their time and putting a lot of thought and consideration into their next world history text um, and thinking about uh, resources there. So I would agree, I appreciate our students taking note of that. Um, we can always continue to push on that envelope, but um, we have added a number of texts over the last um, six and seven years, and and I know there will be more to come. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Um, do we want to keep moving forward or we want to take a short break? Break. All right. It is 7.50. Let's go to 8 o'clock, 8.05, 10, 15, 8, 8 o'clock. We're in recess till 8 o'clock. Thanks, everyone.
Oh, sorry, I'm late. <laughs> I was having some technical difficulties. Um, Just waiting on Maggie time. We'll get started. Not to call her out, just that, yeah. There she is. Sorry. No, no worries. Um, okay, Ada, oh, now it's Ada too, back um, in session. And we are on Partial Governance Process Monitoring, Board Policy 1800 OE6, board, Budgeting, Financial Planning, budget assumptions for 2021 and 22. So Ty is going to give you an update. We do have a slide deck, which is attached. Um, who's going to drive? Ty, are you ready to go, Ty? There it is. All right. Start at the beginning. Sorry, the mute button moved on me. Apologize. Um, so it's it's important in especially in this year to make sure that the board and the community have an understanding of where we are fiscally and financially and the the thoughts that we are going into uh, as we're planning next year um, and we've we've tried very carefully to especially uh, over these last couple of months to to inform the board of all of our uh, major inputs and thoughts uh, and concerns as we're uh, as we're preparing for next year. Um, so I wanted to just kind of touch base. We had told the board that we would uh, report back to you on uh, changes in funding um, related to enrollment loss. Um, we had anticipated, we had forecasted at the beginning of the year based off our enrollment loss about 2.6 million um, at the end of January when OSPI rebalanced our enrollment uh, loss. Uh, the reduction to our funding was $3 million. Um, and there's uh, there's some more information about the enrollment um, a little bit further down in the presentation, but uh, it's a little bit more than we had anticipated. Um, we knew that transportation funding was going to be impacted uh, due to the reliance of the formula on ridership. Um, we, are, we had budgeted about 1.4 million um, in transportation funding, which is restricted solely to to and from transportation. Um, uh, the first counts in the fall um, were very slim, <laughs> uh, to say the least. Uh, we were transporting our special ed students uh, and some smaller cohorts at the time of the count. Um, so we were not able to count much. Uh, so our funding has been reduced from 1.4 million to uh, just under 750,000. Ty? Yeah. Um, you're screen sharing. Could you um, match up the slides you're on? I think you're a little bit, you're showing a little bit further on than what you, you're um, discussing. So I don't know if you want to just, there you go. Oh, I apologize. <laughs> Thank you. I, sorry. I didn't realize I was on the wrong slide. Um, uh, local revenues uh, are down 8%. So local revenues are, uh, as we mentioned before, our lunch money, uh, lunch collections, um, uh, fines, fees, uh, all of the the smaller collection items uh, that we get from uh, the operations of the the in person that we would normally see from in person district um, services. So those are that's a uh, eight percent loss uh, on what we had projected year to date. Um, our levies are stable. Our federal funding. Um, our normal grants are stable. Um, so really what we're looking at is reductions in um, general apportionment and transportation at this point. And we can see, um, we can see- I'm Sorry yeah. to interrupt again, but on the reduction of the general apportionment, um, it has changed from when we initially talked with the board back in January 
it, we were talking at that time about a two point six um, million dollar, and now your um, it's the actual yeah. We when I when we had run the initial revenue loss through the funding models in the fall, we were anticipating a two point six million dollars um, reduction. Um, but as we've gone through the school year, because it's not just October enrollment, but they also factor in the annual average enrollment. So every month we report enrollment to OSPI and um, they take a look at the average uh, and that's also factored into the model. Um, we have been slowly losing some students um, throughout the district uh, as we've gone through the school year and we'll, as I said, we'll get down when we get a little bit further, we'll talk about that and um, some concerns we have looking forward. But um, our year to day revenues, you can just kind of graphically see what we had been uh, looking at. We have been anticipating uh, projected year to date about roughly $20 million. Um, we've received about 15 and a half um, uh, plus some uh, other smaller categorical and uh, Sure, special ed, um, two, two and a half. So we're looking at about 18 million from the state out of the 20 that we anticipated. Um, and as I said, we're about 80% down on local. When we look at our expenditures, we are spending less um, in terms of what we had anticipated, but the differential between what we're spending versus what we had anticipated to collect um, isn't quite canceling each other out yet. Um, and because we're looking at $3 million shortfall, it's not going to cancel out. Um, our savings are not going to equal our um, revenue loss. Um, looking at the projected ending fund balance for the school year, um, we ended the month of January um, at $4.2 million, which is tracking close to what we had projected. Um, we are just barely closing February this week. We just got the, the reports from the bank um, uh, a few days ago, so we're still closing it. Uh, and you'll have um, the February report at the next board meeting. Um, so you'll have as much up-to-date information as possible. Um, and I will also reproduce this uh, chart um, to go with that um, report. Um, but we are looking at the revenue losses we are looking at about uh, ending fund balance of 1.9 million which uh, is about three percent um now looking at enrollment um this is where i have some concern looking forward into next year um as we have been moving through the year, we had a pretty significant loss of enrollment. Uh, and this table specifically is general ed, ALE um, is on a separate table on the next slide um, because this has been pulled directly from OSPI's website. Um, but as you can see, as we've moved through the year, we've slowly been losing general ed students. Um, and quickly moving to the next slide, you can see that um, we've also, we've gone up a little bit uh, in ALE, but it's also decreased um, as we've gotten further into the year. Um, we had a spike and now we were leveling out a bit more. Um, so as we're looking towards next year and what we are looking at and anticipating for enrollment, the initial thoughts and discussions that we had had um, was the likelihood that we would see uh, a small balloon, especially in kindergarten um, and some returning students. Um, but as we're looking at the enrollments and this is not necessarily isolated to Mercer Island, but it's, it's more of a systemic problem is that as families are going longer and longer without being in person, they're withdrawing and seeking other options. Um, uh, there is not an, the biggest notice, uh, the biggest change that we've seen 
um, is coming out of the, the high school uh, in terms of enrollment loss, um, especially in ALE. Um, uh, it gained the most and now it's dropping back down to where we started the school year. So uh, we, I do have some concerns as we're moving into next year with the possibility of being in a hybrid. Now there's some rumblings of potential changes to the physical distancing requirements. Um, there's a lot of pressure being put on the State Department of Health um, to change the six foot to a three to six foot range, um, which would give us the ability to, to have more kids in the classroom and hopefully stay out of hybrid. But the possibility of starting next year in hybrid, I think is of significant concern for our enrollment projections. Um, so as we are moving forward, um, it's something that we need to be aware of as a district and that we felt we needed to provide information to you as a board um, about what we're looking at. Do you have any questions so far? Okay. Um, if I can jump in there for just a second. I do know that in gross substitute house bill 1476 that we're all tracking very closely would be that's the um, enrollment stabilization bill. Um, and it's it still has steam and is moving pretty well. That would say that essentially for the next two years, if our enrollment is smaller than the 2019-20 school year, that it would balance that and equal it. How, obviously, you can't figure that into the equation right now. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Um, are you hopeful? Are you, what is your, I, I, what is your crystal ball saying? <laughs> I wish my crystal ball was cleaner. Um, it's, I, I remain cautiously optimistic that we'll see something right now, um, as I understand it, um, from the latest updates that we've had, um, and we're going to talk about legislative updates next. And so we can just jump over there, but, um, enrollment stabilization, most of the conversations that I've heard is that they're pulling the actual enrollment part out of the bill, the actual state funding part out of the bill and moving it into the budget. So it would be treated as part of a supplemental budget and then the budgeted option for the next biennium. Um, what's left of the bill that's on the floor now is mainly provisions to protect levy uh, authority and levy collections, um, which would help us. It's great, it's awesome, we love that. I mean, we're, we're projecting to lose half a million dollars on our levy over the next two years if we don't get some protections. Um, so it's great that that's still in there. Um, what I do find slightly concerning is a lot of the language revolving the use of federal stimulus dollars to backfill um, enrollment loss uh, and essentially supplant state dollars. I don't think there's necessary supplement or supplant problems um, tied up with the, the ESSER dollars, but um, we did receive our ESSER allocation um, this week. We got uh, the, the grant portal opened up uh, and we are eligible for $285,000, um, which can go a long way towards preparing us for next year. But remember, this is a one-time dollar allocation. Um, it's not something that's gonna um, carry us very far in terms of enrollment loss. Um, it's a 10th of our, less than a 10th of our enrollment related losses this year. Uh, it's important oh. to note that um, as Ty put on the slides here, you know, planning process to how to use the funds to recover learning loss. Um, some of this is anticipated to be used to support um, an expansion to what we've normally done in summer school. Um, you heard that description earlier today in um, their staffing costs for that. We don't want to um, not be able to include those who want to be there, but there's um, scholarships and whatnot that would need to be tied to that. Um, so we would certainly be tapping those dollars for some of that program as well as other elements in um, what we've had to submit, which is called our recovery plan, which we did just receive today that we're, we're good to go with, with that. Um, 
So uh, people look at that amount and, you know, they hear the, the millions and the billions that are coming from the federal level. But I also think it's really important for, especially on Mercer Island, to realize that when Ty showed the slide of our revenues that come from federal dollars, it's a very, very tiny slice because it is based on Title I allocations, which are counted by virtue of the um, free and reduced lunch counts in a district. Um, a district like ours will receive, um, if it's all based on Title I, will receive very small amounts. It won't be in a line with a district that has a 40 to 50% of their population in that range. Um, I was not able to attend a meeting earlier this week, but Fred did and took copious notes and um, Superintendent Reichdahl was speaking to superintendents at that meeting. And he said that um, these anticipated dollars in this next federal um, relief bill that's been just signed by the president of trillions of dollars could very, will very likely also be tied to Title I. And his comment was, and Fred, if I get it wrong, um, correct me, was that many districts will um, not see an amount that will make them even close to being whole. Many districts will end up being, um, were his words in the whole, Fred? You're on mute, Fred, sorry. Yes, I am. Uh, yeah, his comment was, um, he of the 1.8 billion coming to Washington, um, that it's going to be very disproportionate in terms of its allocation, and that it will continue to be based on Title I. And so, for he he mentioned, you know, districts, and there are several in our region who don't have a large Title I um, uh, allocation to begin with. That we could be in situations where we won't break even. Um, we will not break even because of this funding. And so that's why the state has continued to talk about what are other ways to backfill us, but um, we will not see the gains or the, the reap the benefits that others will. Um, and there are reasons certainly for that, but it's certainly something we need to be aware of as a school district. And even with all of the the different options that are being proposed. There's a lot of talk about how to to backfill out of either money that's set aside for OSPI or um, making districts whole with federal dollars and then using state dollars. It's nothing has been concretely put forward as a budget plan. Um, uh, the state revenue forecast is coming out on the 17th of next week. Um, which after that is when we would expect to see some of the proposals being put forward about what the, the different legislative caucuses are considering for their budgets, as well as uh, the governor will release his proposal, OSPI will release their proposal, and then somehow through the magic of legislative work, they combine and create something distinct. Um, and we, we really don't anticipate seeing anything concretely adopted in terms of uh, budget plans until the end of April, at the end of the legislative session. Um, and with all of the different concerns uh, and funding issues that are being raised, especially uh, with all of the money that's coming out of the federal government and the stimulus plans, um, and the, the, the difficulties in which the legislature finds themselves operating remotely. I mean, if if we as a as a district find it difficult to operate in Zoom, imagine trying to work as a legislative body, a large legislative body. Um, so I would not be completely surprised if they extend it a little bit um, beyond April. Um, but uh, there are plans. There are there's a lot of talk about how to try to backfill enrollment stabilization. But at this point, nothing is concrete. Um, for instance, transportation stabilization, budget stabilization, uh, the Senate bill, um, I don't remember the number off the top of my head at this point, but the, there was a bill on the Senate floor. Um, the provision was for 70% of the, the funding um, that we received in 1920. Um, after it passed out of committee and hit the actual floor, uh, 
there were three amendments that stripped the bill just bare. Um, and now essentially it's a safety net proposal um, where if you can't be made whole out of all of your losses, out of all of your federal allocation, then you can apply to the state um, for this small bucket of state transportation dollars. Um, so it's, we will continue to pursue it. We will continue to work with the, the advocacy groups that we're a part of, uh, either through WASBO or through the School Alliance, WASA, WASDA, um, to continue to push for these bills to be progressed. Um, but it's, uh, at this point, there is still nothing concrete in terms of what these plans look like. Uh, it's still pretty murky. Um, and I wish we had more concrete news for you, but at this point, this is what we have. So uh, any, any other questions, concerns, thoughts? Ty continues to also work with FEMA. They have been, um, they are certainly a government entity that has a lot of hoops to jump through and um, a lot of tracking and it changes. Um, it's kind of a standing monthly um, conversation that he attends and it changed again this month, but there's still no, um, yes, this is what we're going to be able to allocate. So we are, we are looking at every um, avenue that we can. Some of the dollars are coming with strings, even though it says there's no strings, there are um, certain categories in which you have to um, indicate that you're spending those dollars in. Um, much of the um, initial ESSER dollars were for reopening. And so things like PPE, um, and I know that we have purchased a, a ton of PPE. We've, we've um, done a, a, an amazing job with that. But just as an example, in the new um, Department of Health guidance that came out, I think it was January 16th, they added performing arts um, standards, which previously had been just don't do them, right? You shouldn't have any in-person performing arts for um, choir or band or orchestra or cheer, I think was the other one because there's lots of yelling and, and that's not um, something we need to be doing. So we quickly went through that, our team went through it. And um, at this point to be able to have some in-person for those programs, I think Ty, you told me it was about $34,000 for the very specific PPE that we need for our instruments and our students to be able to participate in um, choir and band and orchestra because all of those instruments we know can um, be a, a huge transmission. So um, just to not one idea of some of the, the costs that, that we've incurred, certainly we have had some savings as Ty mentioned, but there's, they're not um, closing the gap um, such a large portion of our expenditures is staffing. And yes, we made some reductions in our transportation early on in the year, but um, basically throughout the year, we have continued unless a position attrited naturally by through a resignation, um, we have continued to, to be staffed at the level of um, an enrollment that was projected to be 200 students higher. Any questions? I will thank uh, Ty for his just uh, being very dogged on, on this effort. I, I think the last time, oh, sorry, the, amongst the first times we heard this was back in July of last year um, that you raised this possible concern. Uh, maybe perhaps even earlier than that, but uh, at least I, I remember around uh, around the July, August timeframe that you had raised it. And, you know, it's, it, it's you've been very, very clear around the, the enrollment projections decreasing. You've been very clear around our expenses uh, decreasing a little bit, but also increasing in terms of uh, the pandemic related expenses. And that's been repeatedly clear on, you know, multiple updates to the board. Um, so I appreciate all that. And then finally, now we are seeing this additional loss in funding uh, as well. 
So I, I appreciate the consistency of your message. And for at least nine months, uh, it's, it's you, you, you've blown the horn. <laughs> and I think we've, uh, we've even looked at the budget uh, fund balance and you know, we acknowledge we would be out of compliance on that a long time ago as well. So I appreciate that consistency. Um, I also appreciate that from an equity standpoint, you know, we might not get all the money back that we need. And clearly in this administration, equity has been a, a big, a, a, a big turning point for the organization. Certainly there are uh, communities that have been hurt much worse than, than ours has in terms of uh, the community itself, as well as the schools and students. So I can, I can appreciate that. And as well, our fund balance looks like it is well under uh, what our loss is going to be uh, from the state. Um, it's, it's, it's a pretty hard position. It looks like we're in. And I, I do think that one of the things that as a, from a long-term perspective, it's too late now would be to think about how do we, how can a community like ours handle these issues itself and take advantage of its privilege in some ways to be able to do that. And the only, only, opportunity we have would be to increase our local levies to be able to do that. But I know we have not pushed for that in, unfortunately, in, in any fashion. And that's maybe something we might want to think about depending on how this, this impacts us. Uh, and it, it is a challenging place to be to think about that too, <laughs> because I appreciate it it exploits our privilege when we when we do things like that but uh maybe that is something we do have to look at and think about in a in a serious way anyway i i thank you for all this so far ty i just wanted to be complete and appreciate all the work and the consistency you have shown on this Director D'Souza, to your point, the new levy structure that came as part of McCleary for Mercer Island became a per student allocation. And so we are carefully watching that um, one bill that is at least tying it back to the enrollment that, as Ty mentioned, that will be um, a help for us because we are on a per student, 2,500 per student um, count, accounting for that. But our levy collections occur on that that different cycle so that wouldn't be something that um, we would see until um, later the other piece that I want to remind um, the board of is pre-pandemic our enrollment trends that we pr were projecting were declining and we had started to already build in in our future four-year budget uh, a way to uh, remediate that um, for future years out. The um, pandemic, of course, exacerbated that decline um, even more so. Districts all in the region have experienced a, a decline. Districts across um, the nation, frankly, um, have experienced that decline. Of course, it it's, was certainly exacerbated by the, by the pandemic. I guess it also speaks to the, uh, the budget stabilization bills, even if they do pass would be a one year fix. And then beyond that, we'd still have to address this issue too, because budget stabilization isn't a two or three year fix. We don't know how many students will come back if we're continuing hybrid and all those type of issues too. So I think that also increases the urgency to address this now versus hope that there's a magic pot of gold later on. There's, there's also, sorry, there's also um, a baby bust apparently occurring right now, which I'm sure the, the demographer that the district works with is all over, but that means that that we can't count on the same steady, you know, pre-pandemic rate of kids coming into kindergarten, going back to normal within, you know, three, four, five years, I guess, well, five, six years um, because of people postponing having kids they would have otherwise had this year. 
Um, I will say that the, the demographer that we use as a, an outside check on our, our own projections, uh, Dr. Kendrick, Les Kendrick, will be meeting with a, a large group at the ESD next week um, to share his thoughts about what to look forward to. Um, so it'll be very interesting to hear what he has to say. Um, when we did our projections, not this last December, but the December before, we brought him in to do a, a mid-cycle update for the long-range facility master plan. And uh, his update also projected over the first five years of that 10-year span a decline um, that mirrored closely our own. So it's it'll be very interesting to see what he also has to say about the region as a whole. If I can jump in there as well um, on the bandwagon. So uh, a couple of things uh, I wanted to point out as we discuss this uh, is when McCleary happened uh, for a district like Mercer Island, uh, essentially the bulk of McCleary was funded by taking what we were generating in our local levy and being handed back to us as a state apportionment. Um, so now we're going to be reliant on that local levy um, and the stabilization and enrollment there, but it's a much smaller piece of the pie than we had just a few years ago. Um, so it's not as significant as it might've been. Another aspect that we need to look at is that um, a full-time enrolled student is different, whether they're a general education student or whether they're in an ALE. So we're funded at a different level for a student that's in a um, remote, fully remote, not red remote, um, but the MI online program is just a different funding model. And while there's talk of fixing that or correcting it, there's nothing actually in action right now in policy or change that's substantial enough to count on. Um, so just uh, the final part of that, um, you've heard us talk many years, President Lurie and I meet on a weekly basis with um, our uh, folks in the region, uh, districts that are very close to us. Uh, and part of that work is working with public health on a regular basis for updates and to advocate there. Uh, but we've also been advocating directly with the county council, the county executive. We've met specifically with Superintendent Reichdahl at SPI. We've met with the chief of staff of the governor. Um, and tomorrow we are scheduled to meet with staff members from Senators Cantwell and Del Bene. Um, and we are consistently telling the story that under the ESSER 1 and ESSER 2 models, um, that in following the titled programs in Title I, is specifically not funding districts like Mercer Island. Um, that while we absolutely believe in the equity necessary to fund schools through Title I and the additional support they need, we're not addressing the simple headcount issue that every student requires new interventions in a global pandemic. And under this funding model, um, districts, especially those here on the east side of King County, are not receiving the funds for that. And that matters in very different ways with our partnerships from our local level all the way up to the federal level. So we continue to hit that story and tell that story. Um, so as we have data that we can continue to use and show just how much into the whole Mercer Island is going and how little money we're getting to dig back out of that is gonna be really important to share um, as we try to get more funding to districts like ours to help correct this, what's happening right now. Um, and we're, we're looking at, you know, the impacts of this are going to be long-term. Um, something from the equity conference that we just heard and it really stuck with me is just reiterating the, the statement that cuts to education never heal. So any cut that happens to education now, those dollars that we lose now, we will never be able to regain that ground when it comes to cost of living and increases and as we continue to move forward. Um, so President Lurie and I are working really hard to advocate on every level we possibly can and every ear we can get to on this. But uh, thank you for tracking this, Ty and Superintendent Kolosky and um, keeping us updated and agile. Are there any other questions? All right. The um, slide deck is part of the um, board agenda, but we will also make sure that it gets posted in a 
on the web page as well, where we have the other budget updates so that folks can access it easily as a tool. Okay, so um, obviously this is gonna have impacts, um, budget impacts. And uh, so I guess next we are heading to board policy 1800 OE7, financial administration, reduced educational support program draft resolutions. So Aaron, we'll talk to you uh, about this, but do you know that this is a discussion item? This is a first reading, um, of course we, put Ty's presentation first for that explanation and that contemplation of all the other pieces we've looked at in having to make this um, very, very difficult decision to bring this resolution um, to the board to give authority for um, a reduction in force. And um, before I turn it over to Aaron, I will just let you know that we really looked at it in two, two kind of categories, one being, um, the enrollment projections, as Ty said, he's still concerned about the numbers that we've projected and the staffing that we've we've said we believe we need next year. Um, how many of those students are going to come back is an unknown. We've we've grown it a little bit. So there's that enrollment category. If, if you don't have those students, um, we're not getting funding for the staff for that. So that's one category. The other category is um, those long-term reductions that will um, impact over time as um, Director DeSouza mentioned, restoring um, some of the overspending we've done this year in spending down the, um, the reserves, the fund balance in sustaining all of the staffing through this year and how do we make sure that we're still in a space that um, provides some some cushion and some risk mitigation in, in the future to continue to, to spend that down is of course very problematic. So we um, have presented this as two resolutions, one that is specific to certificated staff and one that is specific to classified staff. Aaron, go ahead. Hopefully your sound works tonight. <laughs> Again, I apologize for the other day. Um, hopefully I've had some tech support. So <laughs> I, I hope you can all hear me. Um, so as Donna or Superintendent Koloski introduced me, I will be, I'm going to be describing the um, reduction in force resolutions, typically called a RIF revolution resolution, but it's really a reduction in the um, educational program. And we did present it in both a certificated and classified. So there's two, as she described. Um, and really the COVID-19 pandemic has created a crisis across the country with respect to many organizations and schools are not immune. Um, I think we've seen that and we've demonstrated that to you over time with our um, enrollment reports, which showed an ongoing decline. Um, and just the expenditures we have. And we basically come to a point where um, looking at next year, our anticipated revenues, as we currently understand our budget, um, and I do have to highlight that because I think there are still some unknowns there, um, isn't aligning with our anticipated expenditures if we make no changes. So that leaves us with a situation that in order to achieve the objectives of the district, um, we have to make changes if we need, are going to stay fiscally health, healthy. Um, and it, it is important um, to recognize we are talking about people and that although reduction in force can improve our sort of financial picture and our ongoing health and is something as stewards of the school district because what we can't do is operate in the red, we have to do that or you do as the board. Um, it's still hard and it can have um, negative impacts on our, our culture of the school and our employee morale. So that's not, this is not something we bring to you lightly. And I do want to highlight that. So as I said, we prevent, presented the student enrollment and that it's declining. We do hope to recapture some of the students who have left the district as we move into 
to next year. And as we've demonstrated how well we've done both remote and that we're being very successful in bringing our students back in hybrid, but we don't really know how many of the students have come back or might come back. So we're stuck with using our projections. Um, we have cut non-salary expenditures to the best we can, limiting professional development, limiting travel and that type of things. But unfortunately in school districts, um, those cuts don't have a significant impact because over 85% of a school district expenditures, including our own, are driven by staffing. So that really leaves us to address um, and meet the needs of programs we do need to cut staff in order to maintain or achieve our educational objectives. So we feel that there's a financial necessity to adopt a reduced program. We have looked at, so we started with the numbers we felt were going to be necessary to reduce, to sort of balance that out, balance our, our losses with respect to funding. Um, so the numbers of staff that would be required and then you take away from that number those who are going to be on either leave or who have resigned. And each board meeting, you get a personnel report that reflects those who have resigned. So the numbers you, you are getting are actually only reflect or generally reflect those that are going to actually have to be cut. It doesn't reflect those who are just not being backfilled. Um, and I think we referenced that before. So I do wanna make sure that you understand that, that this shows that, this does not show those staff members who were not back filling. So if you go to the attachments, um, I'll just give a highlight there and then I will be prepared to answer questions. So exhibit A, um, both of the two resolutions are very similar because there's similar requirements for us to go through when contemplating this type of thing. Um, but they are different in terms of who is identified as being cut. For the certificated reduction, there's actually a program elimination. It's being recommended that we eliminate the elementary world language program, which is our Spanish program. That will ultimately result in the elimination of four FTE of world language positions. And that would be an ongoing reduction. Following that at the um, certificate instructional staff reductions on top of that would be at the K-5 elementary classroom teacher. So that's your general elementary classroom teacher, not your special ed teacher or specialist. It will be a 3.0 FTE. Elementary librarian is a 1.0 FTE. And I do want to highlight that this was really seen as a um, as reasonable, especially in the light of right sizing the library program because we have fewer students than we had um, when we had three schools. And when we went from three schools to four schools, um, we just replicated the number of librarians at the same FTE. So we went from three FTE librarian to four um, with the same sort of class sections and number of students. And now we have fewer than that. So it is sort of right sizing that. So now we have we're going back to three FTE librarian. Um, at the secondary, grades six through eight, and again, this is largely driven by enrollment. So you'll see there's not the same cuts at the high school because we haven't seen the decline in enrollment there. So at the secondary, so middle school, the language arts eliminate 1.4 FTE. Social studies is 0.133 FTE. Math is 1.0 FTE. Science is 0.6. Band 0.2, Spanish 0.067, French is 0.2, and electives, which is tech, is 0.4 FTE. And then on the administrative level, we are um, proposing the elimination of a assistant director of student services, which is assistant director of what's otherwise sometimes is called special education. I want to highlight here, you'll see there are very, there's some fractional pieces. We have an obligation so that the union um, and the people who are being impacted know really what's going on. We have to specifically identify where the cuts will be. Um, so those who are being impacted know how to respond. Um, in some cases on a first reading, people would bring just a general number and then fine tune it, but we, really pushed on our administrators to identify it early so we can um, give staff who might be impacted 
the best opportunity to find employment elsewhere should they need to. Um, because we think that is only fair. We do value our staff. And as I said, we would rather not do this. Another thing to highlight with this and this, the next exhibit is that we're asking for this authority to RIF, but should things change and we have, let's say more resignations, we could potentially not have to eliminate three FTE because someone resigns. So that gives up a space. So I'm just trying to make sure this is not something our district has, any district does often, fortunately, <laughs> um, but especially ours. So just explaining how that might work with respect to those who are in the instructional staff reductions, but that be separate from the elementary program because that is going away altogether. So a resignation would not impact um, those staff members. So going to exhibit A for the classified, it's a elimination of the secretary, head secretary, and it's a category five. So if you look in our contract, there are categories um, in our CBA and each individual is put within a category and there's a seniority list. So that's a specific group of people. There are multiple at the high school and the um, suggestion is an elimination of 40 hours per week at Mercer Island High School of this support function. Um, but that doesn't necessarily have to be out of one individual. Um, so how that would be allocated would really be a site specific question. An administrative assistant one stroke two, which is category 23, is eliminate four hours per day at central office. So that's in the admin building. Administrative assistant, the SR and stroke SRC, which is the student records coordinator is a category four. Again, it's eliminate four hours per day and that's located in the maintenance and operations and transportation building, so MOT. Um, then there's elimination of a theater technician, which is non-represented. Um, that's position 32, and that's an eight hours a day, 260 day per year position. And then a elimination of a grounds engineer, which is again, non-represented and it's positions 20 to 23. And that the variation is whether or not the staff member has a license and which licenses they have. Um, again, it's elimination of an entire position, eight hours a day, 206 days per year. And then finally, the elimination of an infrastructure technician, which is non-represented, and that's a category three. And that's a full year round position as well. So those are all largely support functions. So beyond that, do you guys have questions? I know this is a lot. Um, and again, this is the authority we're seeking and it could, what ultimately occurs could change. And of course, this is not, no action is, will be taken until um, it's approved by the board which I don't believe is happening today, as Donna shared. Oh, sorry, what, are, what does, what does non-represented mean in this context? So that means they're not part of the MIEA. There's two MIEA units. Um, there's MIEA classified and MIEA certificated. And the, so that means they're non, um, not union represented. Um, I have a question. Um, should we, support the um, reduction of the, well, removal of the Spanish language program. Um, how does that impact our teacher student ratios in the elementary schools? So that, go ahead. I was gonna have um, Ty answer that we've been doing. Um, that was the first question that was asked at one of the meetings we just held recently, Ty. So, K-3 class size is calculated on a, a mixture of general ed specialists and special education staffing. Um, and it's a range. It's not necessarily, you have to be spot on 17 to one. Um, if you are below 17 to one, you only get 17. Um, but it's a range from 17 to 25 um, that we will be eligible to receive that funding um, it, by, ending the Spanish program, um, we would be moving from uh, just over 16 to 18, 19. Um, we are well within the, the staffing needs to ensure that we're able to, to continue to be funded for the 17 to 1. 
So is it fair to assume that that recommendation is um, at least in part coming because that won't affect this, the current class sizes? Of course, that's one recommendation. It's also been um, closely looked at to make sure that um, elimination of that would also, um, we would still be able to keep in compliance with all our contractual obligations in our bargaining unit. So things like a total number of minutes are for certain groups are outlined in our bargaining unit. Um, prep time is outlined in our bargaining unit. So um, we are we will still be able to be compliant with all of those provisions in the bargaining unit, um, even eliminating, even making the recommendation to eliminate this program. Thank you, Erin, for uh, sharing this with us. Uh, I'm sure, like everybody, it's um, really sobering when we talk about this issue. Um, I don't think anybody, uh, there's no doubt that we have to, unfortunately, um, work with the budget that we're going to have. And we have to, right at this point, be um, think about the future and be proactive about this. Um, and like you're saying, Aaron, is a really um, how at this time are we right sign um, our, really our system? So I have a question and um, I also wanna make a point about the language. Um, so one, as we're doing this, I, I think it's really important to, uh, and I'm glad this is a first reading so that we can digest it. You know, it's not something that we're gonna make lightly and that, um, and we do it right in a way that we honor our, um, you know, educators, but also keep our community to understand our rationale. So I wonder then, as we're making these cuts, what is kind of like the guiding principles that we're making it? Are we basing it on, uh, you know, numbers of um, students per classroom? Donna, like you're saying, uh, whether we're meeting our uh, bargaining um, requirements, you know, I, I think all those kind of uh, details people might not know. Um, or, and then strategies, right? Because it is uh, staff and administration. And so as we're looking at this, um, it would be good to have a large picture to kind of see where as a whole system is impacted uh, because we're all in this together. Um, so, I, so I guess, you know, and maybe not today because it's a big question. It's kind of like the strategy, uh, the guiding principle that led us to these cuts, uh, proposed cuts. And then things like the um, uh, Spanish World Program, um, those are things that make Mercer Island uh, who we are, these extras. And, but then, you know, like art is no longer an extra, right? It becomes an essential. And as we are thinking about this, we spent so much time and effort to build up a program. And I know we're not, we're gonna be in this for the long run, you know, it's not like next year, everything will be magically. But then, so I think we also have to think long-term in the next three to five years, what is the ramification if we have put in all this effort and time and, you know, to get rid of a program and then rebuild it, right? Um, and so it's as a part of, um, we're limited by our budget, but we also kind of have to at least have a discussion on the ramification of that. And I would hate just to get uh, certain programs that we have built up to have it cut and then think about, you know, um, can we reinstate it in the near future? It's just like doing all that groundwork and losing all that momentum. So that's uh, my perspective about um, eliminating this whole program. So I can take a stab at responding to your initial question, which is sort of how do we get here? Um, as I said, it's definitely not an easy process. It's one that is taken with, um, with the appropriate I guess, appreciation of the gravity of the move, so to speak. And I think you start with what is the economic situation in the projections, um, which really ties back to finance um, and what are our enrollment and what is, what is the outlook in the coming year. And then once you have a concept of what is the hole you're trying to fill, like what do you need to cut, then we, by our contractual obligations, we have to look everywhere else before we look at staff. 
Um, so we do look at those non-salary salary ways to reduce it. But again, because we're, a, we're in the business of people, we educate small people or many of them are much bigger than me, but we educate students um, and we have people doing that work. We're not making widgets. So we have lots of people, that's what we do. So that's where most of our costs are. So we look at ways to reduce costs um, where we can. And then you start going through the process and saying, what does enrollment drive? You know, if you notice, I said, we, we're not really focused as much at the high school with respect to educational um, staff. And that is because the enrollment there didn't see the same decline that we saw at um, middle school. And then our, most of our decline was at elementary. So that's why you'll see greater cuts there than you do in the middle school and then the high school. Um, so I think you then look at what does our enrollment drive in terms of maintaining. And you do look at, like we have certain obligations where you have to provide the essentials and you do that first. And then you, so you start your cuts first at the extras, right? Um, and then also seeing what are the district's objectives in the um, near term being the next year, but also the next three to five years. And is the focus given the impact of the pandemic, is there, there's gonna be SEL work that we can't do everything. So are, are we gonna drive that funding to that type of work um, and supports of academic recoupment for lack of a better term? of students. So I think that is sort of the, the process um, and looking at what are the, because in terms of we have looking at, for instance, um, and again, I can't emphasize enough, we're talking about people, but looking at the supports um, in our office or at the high school, like I know these people, but at the same time, those are some of what they are doing are things that we think we can still function and not necessarily have that rich of a support and still serve our kids. So though that's the process we go through um, and trying to make only, trying to meet the economic needs of the district so that we are fiscally sound and, but not cutting so deeply that our students um, are not getting what they, they need and that we are still um, meeting the district objectives, educationally and socially. I don't know if I said that well or not, um, but that's really sort of the process. And your second question, I'm not even sure I remember at this point. Um, so if you could refresh my memory, I could I could take a. No, you, you did a great job, Erin. Uh, I think like a part of this process is that people just really need to know uh, the, the thinking behind this is not taken lightly. Uh, what is the strategy? We might disagree on strategies, right? But at least people understand the rationale. And my second point was um, just, you know, as you mentioned, what are essential uh, as identified by OSPI and what are kind of extras that, you know, Marshall Islands have really put for our students and things like arts and Spanish and uh, word language, um, I'm just making a point of how when we get rid of these programs, it will be so much harder to bring back because we will lose the momentum that we have gained in the last couple of years. And so just kind of um, making a point on that, but there's, yeah. Director Dune, I think it's also important to um, also remember that these decisions have come during a pandemic. And one of the things that we are um, very cognizant of as we rebuild the recovery plan and learning services meets every week and we are discussing this and we've been discussing it from a year ago when we went remote as to what are the impacts of, of, on our students. And we know that there are academic impacts and we feel like we have a structure with our multi-tiered systems of support but we're going to need to shore that up um, ongoing as we come out of this. And it's not a one-year fix. Offering a summer school is not going to be enough. Um, this is gonna be a long-term piece. The other piece is our PBIS structure. That's part of that multi-tiered systems of support, which is all about the social, emotional, and the mental health of it. That's not going to be something that we're going to be able to shore up and say, we adopted a curriculum where we spent um, a 
semester on this, so we're done. Um, I see it as a almost a two to, as you were saying, you know, we get two to three years out. It's 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 a few years recovery, and we're hearing that um, from many who are we're looking to for guidance as we build this plan because no one's been in this situation before. So we know that our students are going to need supports across our system K-12 in, in both of those areas. And so as we are able to have um, funding come in, whether it's one-time funding and we have a couple of years to be able to um, plan that, how do we use that in the areas of recovery um, because of, of this pandemic? Um, I think that that's something that we have been also very cognizant of as we've made these recommendations is how do we, um, how do we help our students um, come through this um, on the other side? I think it's, um, I mean, this is the second time in my career um, going through this. Uh, the first time were my first three years as a principal uh, in Colorado, and it was in the Great Recession. And um, it's very rough because we're talking about, as, as each of the administrators have talked about tonight and our superintendent, these are people. These are people that I've sat at the um, new teacher orientation in August and welcomed into the district. Um, embrace them and we've worked together and we've developed and we've, um, you know, seen, you know, things flourish and none of what we're talking about are going away because we don't think they're good for students or they're good for kids. Those would be easy decisions. Um, and so I think that strategy really does come back to, I kind of go back to a practitioner in our fields work, Mike Schmoker, um, who writes a lot about the instructional core and you start with what's essential, then you go out to what's nice, and then you go out to like what's kind of the extras. And, um, you know, there's plenty of debate as to what that is. Um, some might say it's an elementary world language program, and someone else might say it's the elementary band program. Um, and so there is never a right answer to this. They're all wrong answers. But we have to make the best decisions we can, given the financial um, realities. It's fun to build schools. It's fun to build programs. And as someone who's been here since the beginning of the Spanish program and went back east and all of that, that's the best part about the job. This is the worst part. Um, it is not what anyone wants to have to go through. Um, but there are only a couple ways to make money in public education. One is to go get more kids. And the other is just not spend as much. And that's where we are right now um, as a system. So, um, you know, there's been a lot of sleepless nights and, and very rough conversations um, as we're moving forward. And as Aaron mentioned, uh, the best case scenario is we wouldn't have to even execute on all of these, but we have to be realistic and honest with you as a board up front to say this is what it could look like. And we're going to do our darndest to try to keep it from getting there. Um, but this is where we are right now. So I've heard some um, I've heard some um, rumblings about um, whether or not instructional coaches, especially in the elementary school, who are looking at the biggest reductions, um, are upholding our priority of students as the priority. Um, does can you, can you talk about, well, I, I, I think I know the answer, but I want to be corrected if I'm not thinking the right thing. Um, I think it's also good to kind of have this discussion. Um, is reducing the instructional coach program people, um, is that going to, would that help us get to where we need to be? And would we want it to? So I, I do know that prior to uh, my being in the district, one of the reductions that was made was um, instructional coaches. Um, I find that in um, our understanding that one of our priorities is to have the best teaching and learning for our students in every classroom. 
um, having coaches is what allows us to move towards that goal. Um, so we did not consider a reduction to instructional coaches because that is still a priority in supporting having the very best teaching and learning for Mercer Island students. And um, coaches are the essential component to that, that ongoing support as using this year as an example. And um, I might ask Jamie to jump in here because she is the one who works so closely with our um, coaches. As we have pivoted several times in this past year, um, it is our, our coaches who have really um, helped our teachers in gathering all the resources and supporting them, whether it was technology, whether it is what pedagogies to be using, um, being right beside them in supporting them to really support our students. So, you know, it was not something that um, we looked at as a reduction. Um, it would keep the class sizes lower, but it would not provide the supports to really um, enhance the quality of the teaching and learning in the classroom. Jamie, anything to add? No, oh, I think you you said it. That's what oh. I would say. So correct, so correct me then if I'm wrong. Now, all of our instructional coaches um, are teachers. I mean, they're all our teachers. And so reducing instructional coaches, if we did that, those teachers would just go back to the classroom and then other teachers perhaps, well, then the teachers with the least seniority would be, would we would still be reducing. Correct. Right, okay. David, did you have something? Yeah, uh, just regarding the Spanish program, I know we, as Fred knows, <laughs> we spent a lot of effort and including board uh, political uh, energy uh, and energy with the schools and teachers and parents as well to get that program over the, over the hump. Um, it'd be, it, it would be interesting if we could have some sort of white paper around it that what are the learnings we've gotten from creating this program, potentially trying to preserve this program. I know we've had issues around curriculum and we've had to go create our own curriculum because it couldn't be found and things like that. And then as well, you know, some documented um, learnings from why we've had to shut it down. And maybe that would help us when we create the next program. And, you know, whether it's computer science or something else, um, you know, at least we have, have those, the, the, that, that to, you know, learn and do something better from, especially when I hear it, uh, I mean, I appreciate it is an extra. It's one of the most valuable ways to learn a language is to do it early. And I appreciate it's not part of basic education. So it does come from, you know, other, other funding sources. And so, you know, us having an understanding of that uh, that will help us for the next thing we do with these type of ex extras from Mercer Island might might be helpful for future boards as well. Brian? Yeah, um, so a couple things. Uh, obviously, there was one thing that popped out to me in the classified reductions that um, struck. Um, which was hard for me. And that's the, I'll just call it, it's the theater technician uh, position. I, I know because my career was in the performing arts, that's, that's where I grew up, that's where I cut my teeth, um, that's where I spent my professional career. And I understand that there's so much equipment that's backstage from lighting equipment, curtains, set pieces, hydraulics, um, tools that really specifically need to be cared for in a very specific way. Um, so my first initial thought, because I know so much about that, um, was how could you do that because we need to protect this investment here. I also know our operations folks well enough to know that all of our equipment is going to be taken care of in the best way it can and the investments it can. Um, that's one that to me cuts very deep. Um, and I think that as anyone looks at these lists, there are going to be areas where it's going to cut really deep. Um, 
public education is an area that um, almost everyone has experience with. We all remember what it was like to be there in those facilities uh, as a student, as a parent, like there, there's no one move or cut or change that could be made that's not going to cut someone very deep. Um, I do want to point out though that when I look at this, when I look at reductions in hours and FTE and, and how that relates to funding through the prototype school funding formula, when I look at entire program disappearing or specific positions, the one thing I'm really seeing that's not being cut here, which means it's being protected, is supports for students. Um, there are so many positions that do not appear in these pages because they are direct supports to students and also to our teachers and our, our faculty that remain in our classrooms. Um, and when we look at the, the coming years, which is our job to look a year, three years, five years down the road and beyond, to understand that our, our first task that we've been given this year was to reopen, was return to our facilities. Um, the second task is gonna be to recover. Um, there's so much trauma from experiencing a global pandemic that it's gonna take recovery, not just academic recovery. Before we can get to academic recovery, we have to get to social emotional recovery um, of rebuilding relationships, of our comfort level within the schools, um, those relational pieces that were, were lost or not even really founded or just beginning to bloom as we look at our kindergartners who are just now for the first time being able to experience each other and begin that process of play. So the next year, two years is gonna be about recovery and then beyond that is gonna be rebuilding. Um, what I see in here or what is missing in here, which means to me, tells me it's what's being protected, are the areas that are going to help our staff and our students recover. Um, it's gonna be in counselors and psychologists, it's gonna be in paraeducators, it's gonna be in those people on a daily basis that help us navigate the behavioral changes and social, social emotional needs that we're gonna have coming out of a, a pandemic. Um, and from this, this extraordinary sense of trauma that we've all felt at some level. Um, and so I, I just wanna point out that it's, it's not on the page. And I think it's really important that we acknowledge that what's not on these pages is incredibly important too, if that makes sense. Um, but I know this is gonna shake our community in so many different ways um, in personal relationships and it's, it's not easy. Um, I, I do appreciate that these resolutions are coming early, well ahead of time. It gives people a sense to see this, to acknowledge that it's coming, that the change is coming um, and allows time as the legislature resolves issues and the governor fixes budgeting and OSPI that this, these resolutions allow for this to change and for it to be backtracked as much as it can to, to keep as much as possible. Um, it's not easy, but I, thank you for bringing it up early and, and getting the conversation rolling because it's gonna be a big shift for our community. People have been saying and asking all the things that I wanted to say and ask. Um, but I do, I do want to reframe a little bit how how we on the board are, are thinking about this. this. It's not like the pandemic is over, and this is a decision that that the district is making to you know cope with the fallout from it. It's like this is yet another loss due to the pandemic, you know, like due to the loss of students that's due to the pandemic. You know, it's like it's like we're still in it. You know, like these are not easy things to think about or even hear about having to do. Um, we're, no matter what, we're, we're gonna lose more from doing this. Like thinking about how hard everyone has worked to, to get the, the Spanish language program in the elementary schools off the ground. You can't just sort of like dehydrate that and like put it in a capsule and then, you know, four years from now, like throw some water on it and get back the same program that you had. You won't have the same people. You won't have the culture. You won't have the, the kiddos that have like grown up in that program, you know? So, so, even our best, I, I love David's idea of trying to kind of capture the, the lessons learned from starting up that program, but even our best efforts that way, we, we have to know that we're still losing something, you know, we're still but beyond just the, the specifics in the, in the near term. Um, so just, just to, to, to reframe this, to think of this as like, 
this is still part of our of our efforts to manage as best we can given the situation that we're we're all in you know nationally right now i just um i just kind of does anyone have any more questions and then i'm going to give everyone a chance to kind of um because this is a first reading um this doesn't have to be approved today and we're not going to approve it today um this i i think it's i think I think it will be helpful to kind of hear everyone's thoughts, just like Maggie Ty and Brian kind of gave us. So I want to give everyone a chance. Um, if you guys have more to add, that's fine. Um, in terms of kind of where your head is, um, I just want to share my perspective. And um, I mean, I think it's our responsibility to, you know, quote unquote, right size our district. You know, we're if we're too, we we get funded based on number of students and we staff our classrooms accordingly. And it's our responsibility to do that. And um, I, I feel particularly empathetic to it because we have such great relationships with our staff. Um, you know, I've been through this several times in my line of work. We go through this, we went through this and, you know, after there was a recession, we went through it before that because of a different, because of a clearly like fix with King County um, public defenders and the way that they were funded. Um, and actually I think it was statewide, but regardless, been through this several times myself and it's a feeling of loss and it's a feeling of disrespect and it's a feeling of, um, it pits people against each other because people are fighting for their jobs. Um, and, you know, then people take sides and I mean, it's, it's morale destroying. Um, I think that, um, you know, and then, and then, you know, ultimately the five of us get to make the final decision of whether or not we're going to do this as, as ma making sure we have a fiscally sound budget is, um, is uh, one of our primary responsibilities as board directors. Um, that's just kind of what's going through my head. Um, I, we, we don't have a choice. Um, I was having a conversation with someone just the other day that um, I don't think we have even a slight understanding of the amount of trauma that frankly everyone is going to have to be healing from after this global pandemic. Um, I mean, I'm likening it to, I don't want to be overly dramatic, but I think it is the significant of, of watching someone go through the Holocaust. Um, we, we're losing, we've lost people who we care for. Um, it's been traumatic. It's been um, random. Um, and our students have lost social skills and the ability to thrive and develop in ways that they need to. Um, our parents are suffering because our whole way of life has been disrupted. Grandparents haven't seen their grandkids and been able to put their arms around them for a year. Um, we, we're going to be, like Maggie Ty just said, we're going to be faced with these choices and, and learning how to heal from this. Um, I don't want to see uh, I don't want to see us lose anyone, but we have to prioritize our students. And um, if I have to choose right now between a world language program and a social emotional program that's even more vibrant and um, specific for all of our students, there's no question on what I would be choosing. Um, and it's hard to change and it's hard to say, sorry, we don't need you anymore. And that's not what anyone's saying. Um, I'm really hoping that we can kind of well, kumbaya, join hands and really understand that we're trying to make the best choices that we have to, that, you know, a lot of times we talk about, or I talk about how, you know, this isn't zero sum, like all kids can succeed. It's not one at the expense of another. Budget is zero sum. We get a certain amount of money for each student and that's what we have to spend. And, you know, I know that community members are going to come and say, well, let's fundraise and let's give to the foundation. We can't maintain staff based on donations. And um, the way to fix it is to fix our state budgets. Um, and we've known this has been coming for a really long time. And the McCleary fix wasn't a fix. It was a shift of money, like David or Brian said earlier today. It's just a shift. Um, the way to frankly fix it is to do away with our, pro our uh, progressive, least progressive in the country income tax and property taxes, because that actually is um, what's going to put more money in the state coffers. Um, and hopefully this is going to um, 
really, really impact our state funding for education. Um, I can speak for every board director here that we are doing everything that we can. We have a tremendous amount of um, dedicated advocates in the, um, in the community uh, who are working tirelessly to improve public education. Um, and we're not gonna stop. But you know, every couple, this is a cycle we call budget cycles, and we are are um, you know we're okay, sort of, with our fund balance going down this year. If we weren't okay with that, we would be talking about laying off thirty staff people rather than thirteen. Um, that's just a number I pulled out of my hat. But you know, if we were like, if we hadn't said it's okay to dip down because this is the emergency that we fight for it or you know we save for it um, we would be losing a lot more so we're balancing all of those priorities and perspectives and so that's just where my head is right now um, I am open to hearing arguments on every side um, but that's uh, it's a decision that no one ever wants to make um, but that's where I am anyone else have anything they want to say Just maybe uh, one final thing, Deborah. I think we're all on the same page in that we recognize the challenge of this and that there is no easy solution. Um, I, I appreciate, Erin, that you uh, provide the rationale. Like I said, it, this whole process is just like people need to hear it, need to observe it, and need to process through it. Um, but I just want to put it out there that oftentimes when we make budget cuts, it is often always uh, people who are you know women people of color jobs that are you know seem as and it just isn't the nature of kind of some of as we identify these strategies of why we cut and so um you know as we're thinking about right sizing i think we should also you know we should really moving forward uh, as a board just think about right sizing you know both administration and staff and as we're making cut you know uh, from an equity perspective i would say that sometimes you know it will feel like um, the staff are always the one being cut and so uh but i um i understand the rationale i appreciate this being presented and um i think at this moment um you know um I, I think we just need to sit with it, but uh, so far I appreciate what um, you know Erin had brought up of these um, potential cuts. But just to recognize that you know a lot of time cuts um, administration as a whole in every institution is always growing, and sometimes the staff is not growing, and that's just kind of um, a larger kind of. I just I want us to be aware of that. David? I mean, I, I appreciate where, how we've got here and I appreciate your uh, articulation of, you know, the impact to the people, Deborah, that that was uh, very heartfelt. And I, I certainly agree with, with your perspective. It's, it's a difficult decision we're in. Um, I'm glad this is the first reading. I, I do hope we uh, spend some time re really ensuring we're doing the, the cuts in the right places. I, I know Erin has probably churned this over in her mind a hundred times already. And I, I just, uh, you know, want to make sure that these are, these are the right cuts. Um, people who, you know, it's about 250 kids who have left the district now it's, you know, they're choosing expensive alternatives. Um, I mean, the hope is more come back than we, we, you know, expect right now. I'm not sure we can <laughs> make budgets based on hope. Um, but I, I do hope, you know, I, I, I think Ty has spent a lot of time analyzing those numbers and it, that feels feels pretty secure as well. So I can, I can see these issues go through people's minds. Are we sure about the student enrollment? Are we sure about the cuts being in the, in the right places? Um, you know, these are new programs, very special to Mercer Island. Are we, are we sure these are the ones that should be cut? And 
I will say again that we've we've known about this for nine months, as Aaron and Fred and Ty have mentioned multiple times, they've been thinking about this exact scenario for the past nine plus months. Um, and we've got, got a little bit of extra time where people can still continue to think about it, but it, it does feel like we are having to make decisions, you know, in very, very soon now. So I, I appreciate that. I appreciate where we're landing. And I thank you for the work uh, around this, as well as your decision-making strategies. It, uh, they do seem reasonable. Brian, Maggie, Ty, anything else? You guys. Um, Don, I'll come to you last. Um, Morgan, Paul, do you guys have, if I were you, I wouldn't want to say anything, <laughs> but I, I just want, I don't want to leave you guys out. Do you guys have any thoughts on what you guys have been hearing? No, okay. I don't, I didn't mean to shut you down by saying I wouldn't want to, but it, this just sucks. Um, <laughs> Superintendent Kloski. Oh. Just to Director um, Din's point, we did look across all aspects of the organization. There is a certificated administrator um, that is being reduced in this layoff resolution. The, um, direct, the assistant director position at um, in learning services will um, redistribute that work. Um, and when we redistribute in learning services, it does um, redistribute across our system to our, our site administrators as well. So I did wanna make sure you saw that we did, there is an administrator on here um, and it is something that we did seriously consider. I say we, um, we've had much conversation with our leadership team, certainly as a cabinet with our learning services team, but um, I do, carry the burden of the final recommendation to the board is the superintendent's recommendation. And I want um, the directors to hear that, that these are my recommendations um, to you for how to um, get our budget in a place that we can move forward. Um, and as a reminder, um, this is the beginning of a process. And as we learn more to Ty's point earlier in the evening, we won't know much about um, where the governor's budget's going to land, if there's gonna be any stabilization until April. That timeline doesn't allow our HR department to do the work that they need to do to support our employees um, in this time frame. So that is part of the rationale for bringing this to you now. Um, as so I heard several of you say, um, you know, you've only done reductions like this. I think Fred said, once in his career. I've been doing this longer than Fred, so it's been much more than once for me. And um, it's, it's never easy and it's always painful, whether it's three positions you are having to reduce or 200 positions um, you're having to reduce. But every, every school district, every public school district is funded by students in the system. And when the number of students um, reduce, that impacts um, the number of employees and it impacts um, how many classes you're going to need. And so that was a, a consideration for us. And there are some pandemic pieces that are in this recommendation as, as well. Um, pandemic pieces, meaning what we already spoke about with um, the recovery and the rebuilding um, facilities that have not been used this year. We don't anticipate um, utilizing um, even through the first half of next school year and, and potentially won't be utilizing them um, because of the pandemic for another whole school year. And so some of those are pieces that at this point, we can't justify those services. Um, in the future, will could they potentially come back because they'll be needed? Absolutely. But um, so some of them are pandemic related. Um, some of them are enrollment related and some of them are how do we make sure that um, this governance team is fiscally responsible as well. All right. Oh, Brian? One just final thought from the legislative representative that the legislature is still in session. 
the governor's budget is still being set, OSPI's budget is still being set. Now is the time for everyone who's passionate about this to be picking up the phone, writing emails, and saying that enrollment stabilization, transportation stabilization, and these budget stabilizations are absolutely uh, imperative um, because we're not the only district facing this. Um, but we can do something if we all get the pavement right now and and don't relent on this. So remember, there's there's room for advocacy here. And it works. Yeah. Um, OK, thank you, everyone. We will uh, this will be on the next agenda to discuss again. So um, OK, so moving on to. We see board policy 1800 OE6 budgeting financial planning MISD city interlocal agreement for special resource officer services second reading. So this is a second reading um, action um, is requested for this. If you look at the document, there are a couple of yellow highlighted sections that were um, suggestions from the board to add to this interlocal agreement. Um, Hopefully they're what you had intended when you had your discussion at our last meeting. So we are looking for action on this item. So since I was the lone wolf last time, um, I just wanna to speak to the reason that it makes me a little uncomfortable, but reading the yellow highlighted, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not gonna challenge it, but it's the lawyer in me where we're taught in contracts, um, if you're not gonna put down every example and bullet point, don't put down anything because you don't wanna overemphasize one point um, to the detriment of the others. And even if one is really important to you, um, it's listed there in the statute. So yeah, I, I'm still fairly uncomfortable with spelling that out. I, I get the importance of it and I agree with the importance of it, um, but this is a contract. And so it still makes me cringe a little bit. Um, because it, what it implies to me is that's what that, that's the, what that implies to me in reading it through the contract is that's the only requirement. Um, so that's where my discomfort comes from. Uh, but I assume that Aaron has um, vetted it with the city and they can live with it, I assume. Yes, sorry, you can't see, hear my nod. Um, so yes, this has been shared with the city, um, these changes. And as, I, as it, it, it is subsumed within the, um, within the RCW, so it's consistent with that and they had already agreed to that. So I think um, they, they are in agreement on this. Anyone else have any? Well, I, we can hear a motion. I, I guess I jumped the gun by um, by having starting a discussion before there was a motion. But does anyone have a motion? I move that we approve the proposed interlocal agreement for the continuance of special resource officer services. Ended. Any further discussion? All in favor, indicate by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Say nay. Any abstentions? Uh, the interlocal agreement regarding school resource officer services is approved by a vote of five to zero. Thank you very much for um, the work on that. Moving on to post monitoring language review board policy 1002 governing style. This is a language review. Does anyone have any motions for language changes? Seeing head shakes, moving on to Board Policy 1003, Board just Job Description. This is also a language review. Does anyone have any motions regarding modifications of language? Seeing none, moving on to consent agenda. Looking for a motion to approve the consent agenda. I move we approve the consent agenda as published. Seconded. Any discussion? Uh, motion is to approve the consent agenda as published. Uh, if you're in favor, indicate by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Consent agenda is approved by a vote of five to zero. Superintendent announcements. 
I'll be super brief. Just a reminder that next Thursday we are um, you. <laughs> It's your um, board candidate workshop starting at 9.30. It will be 9.30 to 10.30. Those in attendance will have, um, it is virtual. Those in attendance will have the ability to um, ask questions. We will use the chat for that section. So just a reminder, make sure your calendar has that um, marked on it. We'll do two um, of these events, that one in the morning, and then um, prior to your March 25th regular meeting, we will have a board candidate workshops, second go round at um, five o'clock. That's all I have. Did we, were we gonna meet after? Yeah, I'll send a separate. Okay. Sorry, board announcements, inquiries and reports, legislative report. Thank you. I was able to lean into the legislative committee uh, meeting a little bit before this one tonight. Um, two bills that we're kind of watching closely right now um, are House Bill 1336 and Senate Bill 5383. Those both have to do with broadband, uh, PUD uh, internet bills. Um, both are still moving and it's uh, kind of a toss up. The Senate bill um, really allows or authorizes um, services so long as private industry doesn't object to that, whereas the House bill uh, would provide unrestricted authority um, to all. So um, I think if was they were going to lean one direction or the other in advocacy, they would lean more into the House bill version 1336. Uh, but this comes down to digital equity and ensuring that every student across the state has access to the technology and the internet connection that they need in order to study. Um, and recognizing this is one of those areas that the pandemic has amplified and magnified. It was a problem before the pandemic, and maybe now we understand the problem in a way that allows us to fix it. Um, let's see, uh, other than that, um, I'll make a push here. There's a uh, WASDA trainings uh, on board training around uh, financial things. If you've been paying attention to the COVID networking calls, they've been pushing those out, uh, deciphering district budgets, tracking financial soundness, and um, vision aligned budgeting. All three are really great courses. I think it's $50 a, a course if you're interested, and you can get that through WASDA. Um, they just reduced the price on that. Um, I wanted to point out that WASA uh, is, has opened its registration for its equity um, convening. Uh, so that's May 18th to the 19th, uh, 8.30 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. daily via Zoom. Um, I've done the equity and convening a couple times. It's always fantastic. Uh, and there's really great speakers there. So um, I would encourage you to uh, look into that. And if you would like to register, um, contact Superintendent Klosky and she can connect you with that. Um, I've already registered. Um, also announcing the NSBA 21 uh, 2021 keynote speakers at the Conference for Public Education Leaders. Um, a great lineup. Uh, that's April 8th to the 10th. Um, the early bird registration has ended for that, but you can get to that through nsba.org. Um, and then they have announced the Advocacy Institute online, and that will be June 8th through 10th. That's our federal uh, day on the hill. Um, again, I've already registered for that one. Um, and you can register for that now. Um, that covers everything for the legislative report. Uh, we begin our week on the Hill on Monday. Um, I'm really excited to join with our students as we um, begin meeting over Zoom. It's gonna be really interesting. I uh, hear it's a really tight uh, 15 minutes. Since of course, um, our student representatives will be there. Superintendent Kolofsky will be there. I will be there, I think, functioning as ge a general master of ceremonies and then try to get out of the way. We'll be joined by representatives from Lake Washington, Issaquah, and Bellevue as well. It's going to be a, a tight 15 minutes. Um, but uh, all of our representatives are fantastic, so uh, it shouldn't be high stakes. All right. Thank you. Announcements, inquiries, and reports. Any board reports? Um, it feels like it's been a really busy couple of weeks, but not a lot of meetings, at least. 
you know, I mean, always meetings. Um, but we don't often have Paul and Morgan here still. And do you guys have anything that you guys want to say? Uh, it's way past your bedtime. Well, I'm excited to go back to school. That's that's one thing. It was. It's been a long meeting. I'll admit. It has. That's actually the only comments I was going to make was, um, you know, fall sport competitions are starting, have started this week. Um, there's just, you know, it's been really fun to, um, you know, doing drop offs. I, I'm more at the high school and a little bit at the middle school, but um, the parking lots are full and it makes me smile every time I see cars and parking lots and, you know, the kids, high schoolers zooming up and down 42nd way too fast. Um, but, uh, you know what it's, I, I'm, I'm grateful for it. So, uh, and, you know, here are the band kids out there and the drum line. And, um, I know that drama is working on their spring musical and, um, I know there's lots of other things. Those are just the things that I happen to know about. So, um, it's just, it's, it's happening. Um, I'm hearing silence. We good? Any, oh, Brian. I always do. Um, the Superintendent Equities Advisory uh, convened on the 2nd of March. Uh, some great discussions there. Um, questions, what do we mean when we say, uh, what do we mean, what do we say, and say what we mean, um, was a, a major component of that discussion. Um, we had presentations from the JUST students from IMF. There were curriculum updates, uh, especially around Educurious, which was great. Um, and then we had um, some presentations from our DEI partners from across the district and what's happening at the various schools. Um, skip over that one. Uh, I mentioned that uh, the East Side King County group tomorrow is meeting, uh, planned meeting with staff members from uh, two senators offices. Uh, so we've now breached the federal level. Um, some things that popped out from last week's meeting, uh, which was with uh, Seattle King County Public Health. Um, that the federal pharmacy plan has expanded uh, to help mitigate. Um, they'll have direct allocations for 65 and over this week or had it this last week. Um, the only county that has done better in vaccinating than King County is Honolulu, Hawaii, an interesting tidbit. Um, so we're the second best vaccinating county in the US. Um, there was discussion about masks post-vaccine and reducing transmissions requires multiple mitigation steps, even with the addition of vaccines. So it's still important to be masking and remind everyone that we're in public, uh, vaccine or no vaccine, you gotta keep up those masks when you're in public. Um, and it was great to see that there's been a, a, the first significant drop in hospitalizations of individuals um, that are over the age of 65, which is a really significant benchmark. So Patty Hayes really uh, wanted to stress that and point that out. Um, and we will be meeting with them in a couple of weeks. The last thing I have is, because I've been sharing this with you, the Equity in Education Coalition will be hosting another Lunch and Learn. And this will be an equitable access for ELL students with disabilities and special needs care. And that's March 17th. Um, from 12 to 1.30, and you can find them on Facebook at the Equity in Education Coalition. All right, that's all I have. Thank you. Ashley, Deborah. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. I just want to uh, do a shout out to the middle school um, administrators and teachers for organizing and getting the students ready to be back next uh, Monday. Uh, I'm one of those parents who never made it to any of those um, webinars or meetings. And I, you know, like two days ago, like, oh my gosh, you know, is he an A or a B? <laughs> so uh, you all did a wonderful job in posting the information. And I went through my emails and I looked at all your PowerPoint and I understood. And I'm like, okay, I'm really, I feel uh, more secure. And I know, you know, I took pictures of all the things where like different routes where Oliver should be going, but uh, I know how hard it is to just really organize all this. And for parents like myself, who is really, um, you know, on, on top of it sometimes, but you all did a really good job with your PowerPoints and videos to uh, get parents to really uh, be informed and be ready. So uh, good luck uh, on Monday and thank you for all your work.
Mm -hmm. President Larry, I'm sorry to jump back in. I did forget to mention that early this morning, I received a call from the superintendent um, at Issaquah School District offering um, access for our staff to actually go today without an appointment for a vaccination and they could make an appointment tomorrow. So we got that information out to our staff immediately. Um, I also wanna give kudos to Erin Battersby. She is now the scheduler extraordinaire when it comes to getting um, folks um, scheduled for their vaccinations. I can um, tell the board that the staff members who are still with you here this evening have all had our first vaccination. So um, and that's probably thanks to Erin because she has been getting us all scheduled in there. So um, it's really ramping up and there is lots of accessibility. Um, we, we are really optimistic. And I think one of the most um, joyful emails I got from a staff member is I am fully vaccinated. Um, she was visiting with us this evening, our orchestra director, who is very excited to be back with kids because she has now gotten both of her vaccines and um, there is lots of relief and excitement around that. Doesn't mean we can't still do the, that we still um, have to do the other strategies, but it, it's happening and it's early March. So that's exciting. Thank you for that update. Um, anyone else? All right. Long day, long week. Uh, motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. <laughs> okay, seconded. Um, all in, or any discussion, all, uh, all in favor indicate by saying aye. aye. Um, any opposed? Uh, we are adjourned at 9.47 p.m. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks all.